it's my pleasant responsibility to introduce Mr. Lok Home, who is next speaker, and he's going to speak on new considerations when analyzing long tunnel excavation. Mr. Logholm began his more than 50 year career in tunneling and mining industry after graduating in mining technology from, Kana from Canada. He served as president of Atlas Capco Jarwa from 1980 to 1985, then founded Borotech Inc. Borotech later acquired Robbins with Lok as president. In 2021, he founded Global TBM company and continued the business under the Robbins name, which is now a global name. In addition to his roles as Robbins CEO, Lok is also active in tunneling industry associations. He is a key member of International Tunneling Association has been active in U.S. Tunneling Society, where he served as director several times. He has received multiple awards from around the industry and is an active speaker promoting tunneling worldwide, usually about difficult tunneling projects. So I welcome him. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, it was more of an introduction than I, uh, than I expected. Uh, I, yes, I often talk about uh, the difficult projects because everybody knows TBMs get stuck. And it's always the TBMs' fault, of course. So uh, I try to uh, get some balance to that. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm only going to talk for about 15 minutes, then I'm going to turn it over to a couple of good tunnel projects that are going on in Nepal. One has been completed, one under construction in Nepal. Just because uh, we're close to Himalaya here, and it was sort of a miss that uh, uh, TBM shouldn't be used in Himalayas, but we'll give you an example where they certainly should be used. So, but my talk topic is for... Uh, just some of the considerations when you're trying to evaluate whether a TBM should be used or a uh, drill and blast should be used. Some, just some more consideration on other topics that, in my view, don't get enough consideration. And uh, so, uh, and these uh, points are the environment and the environmental footprint, what that means, and uh, certainly, uh, clearly, just about every uh, evaluation today doesn't give enough factors in their evaluation about the footprint. Uh, in a lot of cases, the cost of money is not properly evaluated. And of course, uh, safety is another aspect. And another topic I want to uh, dwell on a little is the who should buy the TBM? Who should take ownership? And how, how, uh, who should really take the responsibility of having the right TBM on the project? So these are the topics I want to address. And, Get right into them. The environmental footprint, uh, one thing that uh, probably no, <coughs> is not, op not obvious, but TBMs and muck removal by TBMs is totally electric. The, the whole tunnel project, the whole tunnel is done with electricity. There's only, if you have a TBM project, you've probably got less than 5% of the energy used is diesel. 95 to 98 percent is electric and uh, that's just something I would say that probably surprises everybody when I when I say that but it's just not taken into consideration and then there's the aspect of uh, the environment uh, how much of the let's say the natural environment we're going to put a tunnel in usually there's a forest there's other things uh, uh, driving away where we're going to put this tunnel in and how bad or how messed up are we going to make this in this nice environment by putting this tunnel in? That's another uh, aspect. And then I'm going to cover one more, which is how should the TBM arrive at site and uh, what we call on-site first-time assembly. And, of course, there's the other, the less muck you take out of a tunnel, the less the environmental footprint you'll make. So uh, here's a uh, project that's in the planning stages, and uh, they're really, uh, I would say that 
they're well into this planning stage. And if you look at this, I mean, it's kind of a disaster footprint. You have, you have uh, seven access tunnels. Uh, you're tearing up the environment with these long roads to get to the a access added. Then you got a haul, you got nearly as much coming out, twice as much muck coming out just because you're driving the attics, the attics, and uh, and so it's it's a, an embarrassing footprint that our industry is doing when we make a tunnel like this. Uh, then I turn to this Ofta concept. Uh, there's several big TBM manufacturing uh, facilities around the world. Uh, huge factories that uh, you ship all the material into these factories, you assemble, tear it all apart again and ship it to site. And that's not necessary today. Uh, the, uh, so because of the, uh, what's happening to my, I got a technical difficulty here. Hmm? We going? going? Oh, yeah, it's going now. Yeah. All right. Sorry. So, um, what uh, what happens is, uh, you know, parts from a TBM come from all over the world. They, if we're manufacturing in the U.S., we have to bring them from China, um, U.K., Germany, uh, and then uh, put them all together and ship. If we were going to do the project in Rio de Janeiro, take the machine all apart and ship it down to Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Regen, I'll get it right. Regenerate, and so at, uh, so we don't advocate that. We think that uh, you should just ship all the big pieces there, put them to site at once, and you can start the tunnel probably two or three months earlier that way, and then save all the shipping costs or all the shipping pollution. So we're a grad, uh, big advocate of that process. We call it on on-site first-time assembly. It's been used a lot. It was used in Nepal on the second tunnel. Uh, it, it's a proven and good uh, process. Also, you got to be, uh, when you take, make a tunnel, you got to dispose of the muck. And obviously, if you have a drill and blast tunnel, inherently you take anywhere from 15 to 25 percent more muck out of the tunnel than you have to. So if you bore a tunnel and keep it bored to the right diameter, which you can do, prevent overbreak, which we can do today, you have 15 to 20 percent muck disposal problem. That's another environmental, let's say, impact situation that uh, that that it you usually don't see that in an analysis. The other part is the cost of money. I mean, uh, you walk up and uh, you guy comes to me, an engineer, uh, the owner, and says, "How much is this TBM gonna cost?" And I say, oh, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 million. That's the biggest surprise and his biggest headache going forward. Man, that thing's going to cost 15 or 30 million. And uh, well, we better reconsider drill and blast. But the fact is that TBMs can complete tunnels two to five times faster than drill and blast. And if you've got a big power project, and the power project is a, let's say, a billion dollars for your power project, if you can complete that and turn on your power even six months earlier, it's, you might save $200 million just by turning on the power earlier. And that cost of money, I've rarely seen in a true analysis of, uh, of uh, whether to use drill and blast or not. The, the big price of a TBM frightens people, but that, there's enough more than enough success stories to, today to say, hey, let's at least try to put this factor in. So, uh, and uh, another aspect that uh, people worry about a lot is, hey, TBMs get stuck. Every time you get in a bad zone, uh, the TBM gets stuck, and that's problematic for us, stuck TBMs. We're really worried about that. But the fact is, you can, in a bad shear zone, fault zone, water zone, you, with a TBM and a good crew, and even bypass tunnels, you can get through that zone faster with a TBM and a bypass tunnel than you can with an open heading. Open headings are very problematic to get through shear zones. How to get it stopped, 
a tunnel boring machine is the damn best plug in the world to <laughs> keep you out of tunnel, out of problems. At least you've got a, a plug to deal with, work around and help you push the plug forward. But in drill and blast, it's more problematic. And I think we can make lots of case histories for that, uh, for that statement. And this is a, an example of a project in Turkey. Uh, it was a project on the left-hand side. It was good ground for 75% of the tunnel. Right-hand side, uh, really difficult ground. In fact, we had seven bypass tunnels on this uh, right-hand side. And that was TBM. The left-hand side is uh, drill and blast. But if you look at and study this, the total TBM tunnel with seven bypass tunnels was twice as fast per month as the drill and blast tunnel, despite we had seven bypass tunnels. This is a project going on in uh, Nepal now, and uh, my second speech, uh, I'm going to give up here after uh, about another 10 minutes, and the second speaker is going to talk about these Nepal tunnels and, and the average and a little bit about bypass tunnels. The safety aspect of tunneling, uh, obviously, TBMs, uh, not many accidents occur in TBM contracts, uh, in, in TBM board tunnels, uh, especially if you put up segmental lining. You can see this is the working environment, in, a typical working environment in a TBM tunnel. 95% of the workers are in, in, the, in good fresh air, they don't even, uh, you know, if you have a segment line tunnel, probably you don't even need to wear a hard hat in 75% of the, uh, the area you're working in. It's just intrinsically safe, I would say, as a method of tunneling. And uh, air quality is better. Your chances of uh, ground collapse, even with an open TBM, are, are much less. And... Uh, uh, yeah, we don't, ex it's sort of a religion with us. We don't uh, expose miners to open ground. Uh, obviously, th these are good working environments. But even if we have an open TBM and we're putting up lining as we proceed, we make sure that we've got this thing very well lined and supported, uh, probably overly supported just because uh, that's inherently what we've always done. Nobody works under open ground, and everybody's safe behind a big cutter head and 10 ton 20 or 50 or 100 tons of steel in front of them. The, round, the ground's not going to come rushing in and, and bury them. They're, they're safe. So I come to the question of uh, sort of uh, who should... Uh, who should... Uh, by the TBM and and why and who should specify it? Well, the problem comes uh, most projects are competitively bid. That means that uh, you got five or six bidders, and uh, they come in with their bids. And there's one guy sitting at the table and he's low bidder, and he said, "Oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? What did I miss? I can't be the you know." I mean, I'm sure I missed something here. So he's got to try to save some money because everybody else has obviously seen the tunnel is more problematic than he sees it. So the first thing he has to do is buy this $25 million tunnel boring machine and thinks, whew, I got to spend $25 million on that tunnel boring machine. So what he does is inherently try to shortcut we might say to him, hey, why don't you put in uh, some overcut facility in this machine? Or why don't you have it converted so you can put a screw conveyor in or a conveyor belt? Oh, no, 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 that's too expensive. I, I don't want to pay. I got $25 million in my bid package. That's what I'm going to spend on this machine. So what ends up is I would say half the TBMs that go out, not only out of our factory, I'm sure out of Herignick's factory or anybody's factory, aren't what the, really the TBM manufacturers recommend is what really you should have to make sure you don't get stuck for a long time in this project. That, that happens more often than, than one would hope, but it, it happens a lot. So um, uh, what 
And what also happens is the consultants overspec the machine. The consultants don't want anybody, especially an owner, saying, hey, you, uh, you specified that, that rock would be this, and uh, it's 30 M MPA rock, and it's 60 MPA rock. So what happens, I would say, in about 75% uh, of the time, the consultants overspecify what the rock strength they put more uh, bad ground than usually is today. That wasn't the case historically, but that is the case today. So you really you should have a, a panel of people, a discussion, like a group of experts up here deciding on what the right TBM specs should be because uh, the consultants are conservative. They don't want to get sued, so they over-specify it. And the, uh, and the TBM owners probably, I mean, I, I, I'm a TBM owner, so it might sound a little strange, but we're probably better off at trying to specify the machine than most consultants, mainly because we've been on literally hundreds, or in my case, probably thousands of projects, and you kind of know where the problems are going to come and how they're going to come. And uh, consultants are even the best ones, and there's some really good ones, might be on 20 or 30 jobs. So uh, TBM's suppliers got a lot to uh, convey to the, uh, to the project. So the owner uh, should be involved and it should be some kind of uh, sharing of the responsibility. Uh, I show four slides in this machine, two of them bought by the owner uh, right out of the gate. Uh, one was down in, in Toronto, Metro, so which is have some good success as buyer owner. The other one down in uh, Brazil and Fortaleza. And the other two, uh, one you can see the parts, uh, the owner ends up buying anyway. One, because he got stuck, because the uh, owner went broke on the job, so he ends up owning the machine anyway. And uh, then uh, the next one is uh, the, uh, yeah, the next one is the, uh, uh, if, the if you're going to end up showing it anyway, then okay. So anyway, to uh, summarize, I think the uh, total environmental life cycle should be considered in, uh, in how, when you choose a TBM or over drill and blast. You should uh, really look at uh, the accuracy of the time it takes to bore this tunnel. It should be a safety factor in the consideration. And then there should be uh, try to get the most uh, engineers in front of you when you make this decision so that you get the best experience you can get when making this decision, the decision on whether to, what features on a TBM. With that, I'm going to turn this topic over to my second speaker, Prashwal Shraz, so please carry on. I need this. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, my name is Prajwal Resta, and I look after Robbins from Nepal, and I oversaw the completion of the successful Betty Babai project, and now I'm seeing the, the overall operations of Sunkoshi Marine Project, which is doing pretty well. And now, firstly, I would like to thank IIT and SJVN for inviting us to tell our story, especially Ms. Akshay Acharya, who was instrumental in getting us here. Thank you very much. Well, when we talk about tunnels, we generally talk about failures, challenges, but I'm here to talk more about successes. And with the right machine, right methodology, right, mm, right uh, team of people and money, almost all, machine, all projects could be completed in time successfully and some even ahead of time. So I would be talking about the completed Betty Babai and Sunkoshi and what we learned from them. Well, Betty Babai is an example of interbasin water transfer project. I'm sure many of you present here understand what interbasin is. So it's in the western side of Nepal, very close to UP, Lucknow and where we are diverting about 40 cubic of water from the water surplus river, which is Bedi, to Babai, to the south. 
And in the same process, we are generating about 48 megawatts of power annually. Now, this is among mm, the 11 National Pride projects, so getting the budget approved and the priority was not a problem. And this is primarily an irrigation project to irrigate about 15,000 hectares of land, which is going to benefit almost 30,000 uh, people. The total tunnel length was 12.1 kilometers, which we completed in a span of almost 15 months, much ahead of schedule, which I will be talking about again. Now, talking about Nepal, as you know, it's a mountainous country with a tremendous possibility of tunnels and, of course, bridges. But historically, at present, there might be about 57 tunnels being constructed, mainly for hydropower, but there are some road tunnels as well as irrigation tunnels, but they use drill and blast mainly because of the limited scope of knowledge on TBM technology, and the other one is the limited access that we have to the roads, in especially transporting very heavy machinery. But Peri Babai, it gave us a unique opportunity. The tunnel of 12 kilometers, it could be bored only from two fronts or two faces, so which would have taken almost 10 to 12 years after consulting with various suppliers, various consultants, as well as contractors. So the project had to be completed within a span of less than two to three years of the tunneling works, so they had to opt for TBM. And just to give you an example, these are some pictures that I've shown you about building a portal, front portal for TBM. It took almost six months to excavate just 150 meters using drill and blast. In fact, we didn't use much of an explosive since the rock that we faced was very loose and we didn't have to use much of explosives. But the same length in similar strata of geology we bored it within a week, less than a week, using a tunnel boring machine, just to give you a scope of how T-beam could be effective. This is again about the geology. We were basically drilling this tunnel the Hedris Tunnel, as we will call it, in Shivalik geology, which is a very uncertain, fractured geology, as you might know, with one major thrust, the Bedi thrust, between the main bearing thrust, main frontal thrust from the south, that was facing the main boundary thrust in the north. We had to build this tunnel with a gradient slope of around 1 is to 33, that's about 18 degree slope starting from the south and moving all the way to the north towards Bedi River. So this is a general picture of the overall geology. As you could see, it was in a Siwalik, mainly lower Siwalik, as there are three different Siwalik formations. And there is a fault line, which I can show you in the next slide. So based on the geology, which was very fractured, and we expected a lot of water ingress. A shielded machine was chosen, and to maintain the speed of excavation, as well as boring at the same time, a double shield TBM was chosen. And finally, we finalized on a machine length, machine diameter 5.06 and which actually performed pretty well. And it was designed to bore through rock conditions, a variety of different uh, geology, including hard, hard rock. So a few of the design features that we included is double thrusting system, closed shield, step shield, and probe drilling. Uh, if you have any questions on these features, we can talk about it, or Locke can talk about it. I'm not going to go into detail. So, as you can see at the average, this is for Bedi Babai. We completed the whole entire project in 15 months. The timeline that was given to us was for about 24 months, which we finished less than, almost more than, uh, less than, less than two years, obviously, in 15 months. The schedule of the contractor was about 20 months. This chart shows you the monthly advance rate. The average rate, as you can see in Beribaba, is 712 meters per month. 
and the maximum monthly record that we've bored in a month was 1.2 kilometers or 1,200 meters, which is astounding by any 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 comparison, which was during in August 2018. And that was in a month of August, as you can see it in the red. This is a graph which compares the projected uh, projected advance rate with the actual advance rate. Apart from the initial boring, which would include the learning curve, most of the boring cycle actually exceeded the, the projected graph rate. And I would like to stress upon one point. Usually what happens is that what we have seen in few other projects, not in Nepal outside, is you have certain budget allocated for certain advance rates. But when the project, especially a tunnel boring machine project with a segment line exceeds that speed, the budget allocated is not enough, so the entire speed slows down, or sometimes even the machine is stopped. We have seen that repeatedly again in India, which is not really good for a TBM machine, as stopping a machine not just create, delays the project, it actually puts the machine in a very bad position. So I just wanted to highlight that we could come, we were always ahead of the schedule, and this is the graph that shows it. Now, this is very bye-bye. I will move on to the next project, which is now being undertaken. And we are about to finish, and we'll probably break through in the month of March 2024. It was called Sungoshi Marine Tunnel. That's in the eastern side of the country. The length of the tunnel is 13.1 kilometers, similar type of project, interbasin water transfer for irrigation, as well as it has a hydropower component. So the same machine was rebuilt and used for this project. Now, Locke spoke a little bit about OFTA, which is called on-site first-time assembly. So this machine, the main cutter head and the main bearing, was built at the Robbins factory, whereas most of the others, other parts, they flew directly to the project site without having to be assembled at any places, which actually saved time and money. So the, the actual uh, assembly started in September, and we could start boarding by um, end of September, October. So within one and a half months, one month, we could start boarding using this OFTA methodology, which could be very helpful in projects which would like to expedite time and save cost. So this was the 5.1 dia TBM was refurbished into a 6.4 meter diameter Robbins double sheet machine. The geology was very similar, whereas in some areas we faced uh, a hard rock formation of quartzites and granite. The stretch was for about 700 meters. So the machine, which was boring in a much looser mudstone, sandstone conglomerate structure, was also used to bore through a hard rock structure like quartzite and granite. The cover compared to Pedibobai. Pedibobai was just around 800 meters, whereas in this case it was 1,320 meters with two fault zones. Now, I am not gonna talk much about the geology in this case, and this is the advance rate that we have it till now. We started this project, we started boarding in October, and by now we have, to, till last evening, we have bored 10.5 meters, I'm sorry, 10.5 kilometers. And the, the, the average monthly advance rate, as you can see, is even better than Beri Babai, where we have, we have av on average boring almost 737 meters a month. And the monthly record that we have achieved till now is 1,224 meters, which is actually almost at par, or probably we have broken some of the Asian records. Okay, so this is the basic data. I just want to summarize what uh, the general feeling is about tunnel boring machine, that lots of people, they say TBM can get stuck. What happens if we get stuck? Now, I would like to point out that 
getting stuck in a TBM, it's we should consider it being a very normal and a regular thing. Peri babai, the machine got stuck more than one time. And just in last 10 months in Sunkoshi, the machine has gotten stuck for almost three months, three times, sorry. Once it was, the machine was stuck for almost one month. So it's not really that much of a big deal. All, all we have to look at is the average. Even if it was stuck for three times in the last three months, once for more than one month, what we have done is we've achieved an average of 734 meters, and we would be finishing the project much ahead of time. So that should what should matter. I mean, getting stuck should not be much of a problem if we take the appropriate countermeasures. For example, this is a picture which I have included for, is for Sunkoshi, where people are, the, the laborers and the workers are making a bypass tunnel. And I'll show you some other pictures. The bypass tunnel, making a bypass tunnel is could be considered as one of the last options before you try everything else to get the TBM unstuck. But in case of Sunkoshi, the contractor was very com comfortable using building a bypass tunnel, and we were able to free the machine two out of three times using the bypass tunnel, which we did not, I mean, the time we spent was not more than one month, even in a very difficult condition where the machine was stuck in a very um, loose phyllite rock conditions. Anyway, let me move in and show you some pictures of the bypass tunnel. Uh, so the last slide that I have here is the thoughts on the fast advance rate. And the first of all, a proper study of geology has to be made and the right machine has to be chosen. Without a proper study and a wrong choice of these machines can, no matter what machine is it, no matter which contractor, no matter which project it is, the project without these kinds of things could be very disastrous. The second thing which contributed to the success of these two projects is an experienced crew. The project or the contractor even went to an extent of hiring some of the best TBM professionals from all around the world who actually worked hand in hand with local crew. They trained them and luckily they learned or they adopted to the new technology and that's what happened. The other thing is the maintenance. The TBM, as you know, it works 24 hours and one shift of about six to eight hours is shift is scheduled for maintenance. This machine is well, well maintained every day without any failure, so this is another point. The other one is to probe drill. In case of going through fault zones in Beri Babai, we pass through some of the most difficult conditions, but probe drilling 90 meters ahead and using technology like uh, uh, horizontal sonic profiling every 100 meters and verifying that with probe drilling, we were able to move through it in less than a week. So these are these kinds of protocols as well as choosing of ancillary support systems. As you know, Nepal is plagued by power, I mean, power shortages. So the contractor, as well as the project, went to an extent of buying a new 4.2 megawatt uh, diesel generator set to support the system. So on a, just a closing remark, what I would like to say is that TBM, although we hear lots of negative press about it, it's, if we go through these different lens to ensure the right machine, right team, right consultant, and ensure the proper flow of resources like finances, it's not much of a difficult job to overcome even the most difficult projects. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Professor Jetty Sahu sir, to extend our gratitude for the insightful talk by Mr. Holm and Prajwal by giving a memento as a token of appreciation.
Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Gopal Dhawan, and he will be speaking on advancements in rock mass classification. I will introduce this speaker. Uh, Dr. Gopal Dhawan was the chairman come managing director of Mineral Exploration Corporation Limited. He has over 33 years of experience in, uh, in the elite fields. Dr. Dhawan has uh, been involved in numerous hydroelectric projects of NHPC in India and abroad and is pioneer in India in practicing applications of modern rock mass classifications in geological mapping. He was president of ISCG. He has received Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Research Award in 2004, Scope Excellence Award, Outstanding Contribution Award by ISRM TT India for his contribution. Dr. Dhawan has published and presented several technical papers and keynote addresses in various national and international journals. Welcome, Dr. Dhawan. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Well, so thank you very much for your uh, introduction. So I'll come straight to the topic. And this will be covering some recent advancements in the rock mass classification systems, particularly for investigations of tunnels. You see, today we are talking about tunnels in this conference. But uh, uh, we had been doing tunnels since ages. So what is new about it? I think each one of you who is sitting here today after Silkiara tragedy will agree with me that we don't want repetition of Silkiara or any tunnel mishap anywhere, uh, not only in India but across the globe. How can we do that? And perhaps this also will be appreciated by all of you that this can be done if we investigate properly and based on the investigation data we plan, design, do our tenders and do a systematic execution and give time, proper time to execution. Another factor is that there has to be a synergy between geologist and engineer. Geologist and design engineers, geologist and construction engineers because many times I have seen that geology reports are there in the DPR. There, there is a chapter in the tender documents, which is information to bidders, but those are not properly used. And on the other hand, engineer has to understand the limitations of the geology, and he has to make, he has to do some, uh, keep some provisions in the contract so that extraordinary situations can be taken care of. Why it happens? Inadequate investigations, as I have just said. Fast excavation, but delayed support. Risk identification, which is very, very essential in case of underground uh, structures. Perhaps we are lacking there. And we don't do a proper risk identification in the initial stage. And then we lack in the risk, risk management also. Our contract systems are quite rigid and we don't learn from the failures as perhaps, uh, uh, I mean, after Silkiara, we have to see that how much really we learn from this mishap. If we will learn, there will be no repetition. But if we don't learn, there will be some failure somewhere and some uh, people getting trapped somewhere else. So, but what are the, where do we work? This is the picture. This is a, a picture taken by me uh, during investigation of a project uh, in Bhutan. Chamkarchu is the name of the project. It was totally inaccessible. And believe me, more often than not, where whenever you uh, start investigation of a tunnel, 
you plan your tunnel alignment in some this kind of topography which is not only inaccessible but there is a lot of complexity in himalayas outcrops is very less hardly 5% of the area uh, you will find rock outcrops oozing out of the profile and only half of them are accessible most of them many a times are not even accessible so based on 2 or 3% of data you have to construct a story of rest of the 97 or 98 percent and then uh, we have uh, you know not good equipment not drilling good uh, drilling machines which can go very deep into the himalayas because you need truck mounted rigs and there is problem of accessibility so there also we are lacking which we have to uh, take care of so what should be philosophy of investigation in which we can make use of the existing rock mass classification system i have given a term know your ground kyg as you go to the bank the banker asks you kyc know your customer so whenever we start a project we have to we have to ask the ground what are your credentials but ground cannot tell you so we you will have to make efforts and rock mass classification systems can be of help uh to you uh, for 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 uh, uh, for estimating characteristics of the ground uh, ground mass and the geological model which is nothing but kyg and we have to tailor investigation plan according to the ground conditions uh, many people uh, ask that what is the standard protocol what are the systems what are the international codes what are the indian codes yes there are so many but every ground condition demands for a different kind of a treatment as far as investigations are concerned and not only we have to plan in a different manner we have to keep on checking reliability and robustness of the data intermittently in case there is any variation or anomaly you had planned to conduct some geophysical line and you find that there is an anomaly so you will and and uh, you are not sure whether this anomaly is can be interpreted with the, with the existing geological mapping or not so you will have to plan something else either you will have to plan a drill hole there or different kind of in, uh, geophysical investigation so coming to uh, the classification system uh, systems uh, although investig uh, classification system started from days of tazagi in 1946 then deer proposed his uh, rqd system and there are several uh, systems which are in vogue but the modern classification system the modern areas era started with binevsky's classification which we commonly know as rmr barton's uh, q system and uh, then the astian system and now of late i system has also come up and we can use each one of them we can use them simultaneously or we can use them in uh, isolation also we are very lucky after a long time i am seeing that in this hall two of the inventors of these classification system our revered dr barton nick barton and uh, dr benison hoss who has uh, invented i system he is also with us dr barton has already spoken to you he will speak to you tomorrow also and uh, dr hoss will also speak to you tomorrow so we will uh, listen to uh, from them directly from the horse's mouth whatever classification system you may be using but i i as a geologist as an engineering geologist lay lot of emphasis to the correct uh, uh, measurement of the parameters which are required to implement these classification systems because if you make a mistake in ass assessment of the joint conditions uh, you will fail to arrive at a, at a at a good uh, a reliable q value or rmr uh, value or i value so some of the uh, some of the important um, uh, parameters are uh, Are, are identified here uh, after you know 
identification of the joint sets, you go to the um, identification of measurement of the roughness, spacing, smoothness, aperture, orientation, persistence, filling, and, and so on. There are about 14 parameters which are to be recorded in case you want to apply all the parameters. But all the classification systems do not require all the 14 parameters. But some of them require one set of six or seven parameters. Another classification system requires some other. But I, as a geologist once again, lay emphasis on, on, on doing a proper scanline survey and outcrop mapping so that all the classification systems are, uh, parameters are properly recorded. So RMR. RMR started in 73. Uh, Benesky did so many uh, improvements continuously. Uh, chronologically, these are listed in the slide. I will not go into the detail. But 1989, the classification assumed a, some kind of maturity in which uh, five basic parameters were there and one adjustment factor, which is the joint orientation, was there. And he uh, published some guidelines for selection of rock support based on the RMR system also. And after that, w there were further some improvements by his team in 2000, 2007. And 2017, 2014 is a very important update. Uh, it came from them, wherein they uh, added two more adjustment factors. Originally, there were five parameters and one adjustment factor, which was orientation of joint. But in 2014, they added uh, now the, 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 the FE and FS. FE was for the excavation method and FS was for the stress strain behavior. Uh, and they added one more basic parameter which is known as intact rock mass alterability. Uh, so these three uh, new uh, parameters came. And with this, I think RMR, proponents of RMR, they tried to come out of one criticism that Barton's classification system takes care of stresses, but whereas RMR doesn't. So, so, so perhaps that has been uh, taken care of uh, after that. So all of you know that. Um, I'll certainly not go into the detail. All of you know that um, uh, there are five parameters in 89 classification, UCS, RQD, joint discontinuity joint orientation, groundwater condition, and the sixth one is rating adjustment. Now, what happened in 2014? In 2014, the basic RMR, which is some total of uh, uh, five parameters, which they call RMB, a plus uh, factor for the orientation, these two factors were also multiplied, FE and FS. Uh, but to my surprise, uh, people are more or less wedded to the 89 system only. In field, I have seen that almost 99% people, they are still uh, stuck with 1989 version. Although uh, both the classification systems can be used, and therefore, uh, Binevsky proposed a correlation between them. And there is a good correlation between RMR 14 and RMR 89. And there is an equation also. I have seen that there is a variation of about 10 to 5 to 10 percent. But uh, as uh, when you go for the tunnel construction, in my own opinion, we should apply RMR 14, which, which is more robust and it takes care of uh, excavation uh, parameter as well as the stress parameter also. Now coming to Dr. Barton's classification, which, we, which he uh, has uh, given in 1974. And uh, because you have heard from the horse's mouth in the morning, so I will not go into the detail. But there is a nostalgic memory with this equation, which is there, and which Dr. Barton has already explained to all of you in the morning. Uh, because this was introduced to me by my, uh, by my guide, Professor Chobe, about 40 years ago. And since then, I am a, a diehard fan of Dr. Barton and follow this equation almost uh, uh, 
uh, almost every day i uh, i would say so the difference between both these classification systems are that binevsky divided the whole spectrum of rock mass into five classes whereas dr barton divided it into nine categories i try to make in india this difference that when you use barton's classification system it is better you term the rock class as category and when you use benevsky's classification it is better to use the term class what is happening is in most of the cases we confuse in the tender documents we mention the rock class we may be using rmr system or we may be using uh, barton system but there is certain overlap or confusions that confusion has to be removed while working so dr barton has already covered this aspect that how this uh, support chart evolved uh, from 1974 to 1973 and then ngi has further uh, given uh, the improved versions uh, in their 2015 brochure and dr barton has also shown his chart which he uh, has developed with uh, with with uh, uh, dr grimstad okay so give me 5 uh, minutes can you give me please so uh, well i think uh, i couldn't uh, keep the pace with the time so the third classification is uh, is uh, is the astrian system and the fourth one is i system which dr benison hoss will cover himself and now i just wanted to show that i have first used uh, rmr and q in 1986 in chamira tunnel worked very well and now in uh rishikesh kand priyag tunnel it's a success case story where proper investigations have been done in five stages and uh, a reference model was created as far as geology is concerned and finally we could we could uh, uh, have a good case study uh, wherein all the uh, investigation methods including drilling they have done about 167 drill holes so so uh, in india normally we are very miser as far as planning of drilling is uh, is uh, is there in the investigations so in a nutshell i will say that you will have to pay for site investigations whether you have one or not whether you do it or not and i will add to this if you if you if you use the right classification system for knowing your ground that will certainly add to quality of your investigations thank you very much thank you for a patient learning please now i request professor jt sauser to extend our gratitude for the enlightening talk by dr dhavan by giving a moment as a token of appreciation thank you sir our next lecture is online we are connecting vishal uh, sorry ha uh, you are audible sir you can ha uh, you can continue sir yes ha uh, you can come down for yours which occur in the vicinity of the face are the structural instability running of cohesionless soil debris and water inflows and stress factors this structure this on is a stress in the a early stage of the design may be estimated by the stability number capital h number grand n a force in benoma 
1967, the shock stability of a tunnel face driven at a depth pitch in a clay soil unranked region CU. But further extended of types of soil support. Sigma zero is the initial price at the depth tunnel assumed to be isotropic and often considered to work damage. T is a uniaxial compressive strength of the ground. Is the initial stress at the depth uh, is principal stress sigma zero one is sigma zero axis we may use the Depending on the value of n, the situations may be considered. If n is lower than 1, the yield zone develops around the yield zone develops around the color. If n is between 1 and 2, the appears behind the pitch. When two and five, the yield will start to develop in a bit detailed effect. N is larger than one, the final phase is, in, is included in the yield zone. The stability number and be used for shallow tunnels. The tunnel phase stability of shallow, at shallow depths has given rise to numerous studies of the soil and formation of soil. Different methods were used. To sufficiently deep tunnels is collected in the original ground. It is necessary to evaluate the natural stress of the depth of the tunnel and the depth of the ground. The main factor which must be considered for the determination of the natural stress topography, ground behavior, the local geological structure of the whole discontinuities of life, the regional data trace. Different techniques have been developed local stress or hydrofracturing of the rock of existing fracture. But in many situations, these states are very little to be And most of the time, they are insufficient to allow the determination of the stress density. The best state of stress can be obtained by the numerical geomechanical model, such as tried by Stevens. Then, including the main factor of the site. In many cases, only the consider at an early stage of the site, sigma zero is equal to H. The second part of the to is a sigma C. The choice of the unit challenge is far more complex than the simple introduction of results of laboratory tests and samples of soils and rocks. All the complexity of formation scale of tunnel to be considered heterogeneity. 
And the fish needs to be reinforced, not by rooting or ground freezing. In homogeneous conditions, the use of the more long heat is common. Also, you have not to. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we have not good the I'm sorry, it's, it's a, we have not a good slide. Uh, you are not able to see the slide, sir. The, the slide before. Okay, this one. Great. The slide is. Ah, uh, Professor Benny, uh, which slide do you want, sir? Underground lab. I'd like to have the slide number six. Okay, sir. Slide number six. Uniaxial compressive yes, strength of rock masses. That's right. Okay, sir. You can continue, sir. Yes, no. Yes, it is a good slide. In the rock masses, the lead. Rock, oak, and brown has become very common. Yes, a material constant determined with a geological stress index. And last, the uniaxial compressive impact rock determined on rock type of the compressive rock as a tunnel is given by this, uh, by this, this factor 0 and 1, which depends on the degree of disturbance, the rock has been by the excavation technique. Next slide is brown, grass, to have even the radial displacement versus the stability number. Mountain. Carissa, Torres, and Ferro give a baby estimated from the GSI value about 0 0.15 and from the more Coulomb parameter of the rock. C. One megapascal, internal angle of friction 25 degrees. The overburden is between 180 and 500 meters. From stretch measurements and numerical model, it will be assumed that the principal origin of the stress is about 1.2 times the vertical stress. Accordingly, the value is over 12. Very large convergences occur behind the face. They reach 2 meters. Next one. Next one. Next one. Oh, the next, my last example will be the Gibraltar Strait Tunnel. The Gibraltar Strait Tunnel is under study for several years. The project foresees a 38 kilometer long tunnel 
a twin bore tunnel with an undersea section of 28 kilometers. The tunnel will be mainly driven in various fresh formations. The presence of two paleo channels filled with clay and breccia may compromise the feasibility of the tunnel. Next one. This is the line of the tunnel, and you see the, 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 the line with very deep sea on, on, the, on the ocean, ocean, Atlantic Ocean side and the Mediterranean side. Next one. Two channels, two very deep channels were eroded in the in the fish formation. These channels were eroded in Eocene during what is called the Messina crisis, when the water of the Atlantic Ocean flushed down in the empty Mediterranean basin. The shape and the depth of these two channels are not precisely known. The geological investigation in the stress are made difficult by the sea depths and currents as well as, as, well as the ship traffic. The clay breccia filling the channel are rather heterogeneous. Next slide, please. The very low permeability of the soil and the very high water pressure made the testing of the samples rather complex. From the laboratory test, it may be assumed that the permeability coefficient is about 10 minus 11 meters per second. The cohesion comprised between 100 kilopascal and 200 kilopascal, and the internal friction angle is the order of 20 degrees. The sea depth above the channel is 1,300 meters, and the ground cover over the project alignment is 200, 200 meters. A rough approximation of the 100 axial stretch of the breccia may be 450 kilopascal. This data gave a stability number of the order of 150. Considerable face and stability and extremely squeezing condition may be anticipated. To cope with this condition, the drainage ahead of the face had been studied by Lombardi to consolidate the breccia ahead of the face. However, the time, even from a partial consolidation, may be too long to allow, to allow a, reason, a reasonable rate of advance of the TBM. The time for consolidation is proportional to the coefficient of permeability. If there is an uncertainty about this parameter larger than one. This example shows that the computation of the stability number at an early stage of the design allowed to forecast the likely stress induced failure for deep tunnel, to anticipate the mode of construction, and to define the necessary more sophisticated study for the final design. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Panet, for this very informative uh, lecture and slide. Uh, I, I request all of you to give a round of applause to Professor Panet. <laughs> so thank you, Professor Panet, uh, and we are grateful to you for this. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Professor T. Ramamurthy. We lovingly call him TRM. He carried out his doctoral thesis from Birmingham 
as a Commonwealth scholar in 1966, very long back. He has more than yes. He has more than 60 years of experience in rock mechanics and underground excavation. He is the man who started master's degree course in at IIT Delhi in rock mechanics and uh, he had joined IIT Delhi in 1967 and retired as emeritus professor in 2004 and then he is working with the Engron Geotechnic. He has been fellow of ISRM India IGS and he has been awarded Kukalman Award and many other Indian Geotechnical Society Award. So uh, I request Professor Ramamurthy to. Uh, Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, let me come down to rocks. We have been talking of various aspects, but rock as a material, as an engineering material, it's very essential that we treat as an engineering material. What do we need essentially is that uh, in the rock mass, I will be covering the following aspects. First is pointer, you know. So one is the joint factor, JF, correlations with rock mass proper parameters. Application of JF relation in some case studies. As we know that for jointed rock mass, sigma CJ and EJ <coughs> are estimated from these procedures. RMR, Q system, JF joint factor, this is from myself, then GSI, Jelga Sendhi Index. Now, if you see here, RMR by Benevesky, Q system by Barton and others, 74, GSI, like that. Sherafin Perari gave linking the modulus with RMR. If you see here, values of sigma, cj, cohesion, friction, and modulus as per Barton, 2002, for say estimating sigma ci is equal to 100 MPa <coughs> and density is 2.5. If you see qc varying from 100 to almost 0 0.008. For these values, sigma cj1 Compressed strength, cohesion friction are given sigma CJ2 based on C5 values. The ratios of sigma 1, sigma CJ1 divided by sigma CJ2 are given so much variation occurring. Modulus values are given here. But finally, when you come to modulus ratio, you see they are near almost constant. They don't decrease with the quality decreasing here. So there is something correct, not correct, in talking about compressed strength and modulus. Now coming to Hook and Brown. Again here, GSI values vary from 85 to almost 34. The parameter S varies like that. Sigma CJ decreases, EJ decreases like that. But <coughs> modulus ratio, you could see here, that value is not very much different. That means the compressed strength and modulus may not be appropriate. I suggested joint factor. This is based on extent to experimental data of 
jointed rocks and rock like materials these are sigma cj joint strength of mass sigma ci intact value exponential of jf similarly here modulus value you can see for a jointed one intact one ratio with joint jf joint factor is the quality of the rock with joint system what is jf jf is nothing but jn joint frequency number of joint per meter n is the inclination parameter that is connected with the uh, critical density uh, ang angle which is with what vertical that is of 45 minus 5 by 2 r is the strength parameter which is along the that joint critical joint it may be rough joint it may be with clay or maybe reached a residual stage now here the parameters are being given based on the values of last data you could see here as the values of as the values of angle inclined with a vertical is varying from 0 to almost 90 for a u shaped uh, anisotropy that means the strength versus phi value varies in a u shaped manner and this is shoulder shape because <coughs> depending upon the uh, roughness of the joints and all you get shoulder shape also so the parameters have been assigned here based on these values similarly here you could see sorry yeah yeah Here this has been mentioned. The R values have been given based on the values of friction along the joint. Corresponding to that, tan phi are given like this. Here we have clay, different type, 75 percent. Maybe residual stage also. You may have this value. it just goes on right. now the regarding the value of r uh, these values are also given here or different values of compressed strength r values are given Fine grain to coarse grain. Also suggested MRJ by MRI exponential of JF <coughs> modulus ratio we are talking of decreases as increasing value of JF. These relationships are also suggested. All these are available. you can see the experimental data this is dear and weller classification as the rock mass <coughs> intact one here if fracturing it goes on decreasing you can see here also similarly fracture rocks they go on decreasing or the different rocks here now strength criteria here because we are talking of rock mass sigma t tensile strength doesn't come into picture here almost negligible otherwise original problem original problem sigma t will be available 
So here for the giant mass, this divided by sigma 3, bj, <coughs> sigma cj, and alpha j. There's a param this is the equation. B and L are strength parameter given by these values. For jointed one, intact one. Compressed strength again also. Similarly, BJ, B values, BI, BJ are given like that. Assuming sigma t is equal to zero in the denominator. Now here, sigma c is sigma r for jf value you could see here. As jf is decreasing, zero, sorry, increasing, zero means for intact strength, intact rock. Therefore, up to going up to 500. Sigma cj, if I take 100 here, you can see that it is decreasing. MRJ, modulus ratio, is also decreasing. Where in other cases, they don't decrease like that. That means strength and modulus are properly reflected here. You could see in some of the cases, their yeah, joint factor has been tried. Here, Sita Ram et al. and all, and they have used fish functions and all. Joint factor has been used, adopted, or Duncan and Chan group and all. Nonlinear hyperbolic strength relation with initial standing modulus predicted deformation. This is for Siyabaru power cavern in Japan, Kirunawa mine in Sweden, this is Napa Jakri a power chamber in India, and sustained response of jointed specimen for rocks and rock-like materials. Also, sandstone, gypsum, plaster for brown and trello work. So for all these, joint factor has been assessed and have been analyzed. Oh, sorry. It just skips, skips. You could see here how for a specimen with the different joints that you have, the points suggested the experimental results on the specimen tested, and from FEN analysis, the curve goes like that. So there is good agreement. That means JF, joint factor, is a good parameter to define the quality of the rock mass. Here is another powerhouse cavern in Japan. Here also you could see the joint factor variations have been considered here for all variations. And in the displacements from FEM compared with measured data by Hori and Nadar. You could see the variations at that location. Here, the points will suggest observed values. Curve shows the predicted from flag. Similarly here, here also at this location, B7117, you can see that. Good predictions here. Now this is the case of uh, Renewal mine in Sweden for that mine that much long width is so much and all with this giant factor was this much value and the sequence of simulation and all with this we are able to get could see here parameter chosen for this modulus hanging wall foot wall over body, all these parameters were chosen. For this is the slope, critical slope that you could see. Here, mm -hmm. 
Sometimes if a not by Zakaj. Kevin? Two major openings. And here this is vertical stress. Then modulus ratio is that value. And displacement other things were predicted here. You could see here locations, deformation along the line in millimeters. Just a few here. Observed values predicted from flak using the value of JF. <coughs> then for Napajakri, similarly also, here joint factor has been assumed. This value measured for different cases. And you could see there, sorry. Okay. It is not showing. Huh? Last click is your. It's doing. Thank you, Prabhu. Now, the first. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. Here also you can see that the deformations from UDEC and also the displacement predicted by track and all these things, they match very well <coughs> with the use of joint factor. Thank you very much. Sorry for the variation. Thank you, Professor. In fact, you need not have to classify the rock. What you need is modulus and strength, confining pressure. Water pressure effect can be taken as an effective value and therefore you can solve it. Now I'd like to invite Jetu Sahib sir on, uh, to uh, give a warm gratitude towards Ramamurthy sir. I covered a lot of things on the rock as a material in my book, which was published in 2007, and already six prints have been taken already. Six times it has been printed. All aspects of rock mechanics have been covered. Now I would like to invite Professor Bhimanna on stage to extend our gratitude towards Professor J.T. Sauser for his wonderful efforts in the coordination and management for this session of presentation, a token of appreciation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. So we are breaking for tea now. And uh, an important announcement, all the delegates got the invitation to dinner at Silver Oak Hall in India Habitat Center. And there will be a bus available. Once you get out of this seminar hall on the left end, if you cut across, there will be buses available for transport to IHC. India Habitat Center. And some people asked me, can we have our spouse? I mean, uh, this is exclusively for the delegates, spouse, our living, our partners, etc., are not invited. This is for exclusive interaction of the delegates to have more intellectual discussions during that time. 
we have a space constraint there. That's the region, sir. Okay, pardon? Bus will sh uh, sharp. It will lose at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Let's break for tea, and uh, we just got the hero here. Uh, Arnold Dix is here. I think he will join us. Yeah, <laughs> after this, yeah. Let's have a tea break and then we will catch up. Key per person who uh, rescued 41 worker trapped inside a Silkiara bent barco tunnels in Uttarakhand. So big applause for him. He's our national hero. So introducing Mr. Arnold Dix, a distinguished president of the International Tunneling and Underground Space Association, ITA, based in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. With a wealth of experience, Mr. Dix holds a uh, uh, prominent position in the help of ITA, showcasing his uh, exceptional leaderships in the global tunneling and the underground, underground space community. As a seasoned professional, he brings a unique uh, combination of the technical and legal expertise derived from his role as a professor in engineering and of counsel at White and Case. Mr. Dix uh, also received the prestigious Allen Dayland Australian Asian Tunneling Society Biannual Award, uh, making the highest recognition of the tunneling professional in Australia and understanding his outstanding contribution to the field. Beyond accolades, Mr. Dix has demonstrated his commitment to the safety and disaster response through his involvement in rescue of 41 workers trapped inside the Silkara Bend Barco Tunnel in Uttarakhand and other tunnel agencies, including DMRC. His multifaceted expertise extend and advising construction safety, operational readiness, and dispute resolution. We are honored to have Mr. Arnold Dix in our distinguished guest, bringing his wealth of knowledge and experience to our event. So welcome, Mr. Thank Dix. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. Can you hear my voice OK? Yeah, you can hear me? Uh, firstly, uh, I just want to say thank you to all of yourselves, uh, because I know, like me, we're in the business of building tunnels for all of our societies. And the strangest thing has happened to me. The public found out about it. and. It's really interesting that when the public find out what we do as our day job, that they all seem so surprised. But actually, this is just what we do. And I've tried to communicate that as best I can to the media, that actually we're like really nice. And the only thing that's different is somehow or other this event has attracted public attention. But all of you do this every day. So you're my colleagues and friends and uh, look, I hope, I hope I haven't said anything too crazy uh, to the press and the Indian press, my goodness, they're a bit special. Uh, I could never have been prepared for them. I've prepared a little presentation on what happened and this isn't, uh, it's not, all the information is definitely not public. And I've done it in a slightly different style than you might expect. Twas 43 days from Christmas on Diwali Festival Day, you see, when I got a call from the Secretary of MRTH India for advice on a big collapse there be. Rahul Gupta, Chief Engineer, explained to me the facts. 40 men inside, India was going to get them out and cause a big surprise. So it was 40 men in the beginning. I'm not sure if that's the first miracle. I'm not quite sure whether or how 40 men have one baby, but 40 somehow got expanded to 41. So I thought I'd put 40 in there for a start. And for those, I mean, you all know where it is, but I've, I've, I've is this microphone sort of, I can hear my voice going loud and soft, so I'm gonna stick it in another spot. Is that, is that better now? So now my head, yeah. So there's a little picture. So what first struck me as truly amazing was that it involves the Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways, M-O-R-T-H, that's who contacted me. And just between us as a secret, okay, so don't tell anyone, um, they were leading amongst the experts a lot of the decision making because I'd never been involved in an emergency in India before and there's a special charm 
about problem solving in India that I'd never seen in action before, and that is it's very democratic, and if there are 20 people in the room, it sounds like 25 are talking at the same time, and then magically, through this democratic process, a little result pops out the other end, and that was just amazing to see. And after a while, I kind of got into the swing of this dance. Uh, the um, RVNL, uh, the Ministry of Railways were there, Terry Hydroelectric Development Corporation were there, Oil and Gas Corporation, Border Roads Organisation, Corps of Engineers, the Indian Army, Central Institute of Mining and Fuel Research, Central Mine Planning and Design Institute, Ministry of Coal, Defence Research, I'm going to get a suntan, oh, that's <laughs> Defence Research Development Organisation, National uh, Disaster Response Force, State Government of Uttarakhand, State Disaster Response Force, and that's just the beginning. Everyone was there. All the experts from India were there, and that's enormous expertise, because actually, collectively, your expertise is without parallel for these mountains. You know it better than anyone. So I arrive. My message to the media, our commitment from day one, was all men were coming home alive, each and every one. And just to make it harder, when the job was hard enough, no rescuer should be injured either, no matter how much the rescue rough. But the thing I stressed the most, the thing that made all mad, was I refused to give a time on it by Christmas only, said this cheeky Aussie lad. The media were really grumpy with me because I refused to be drawn into the question of time. And the reason I refused to be drawn into the question of time is like yourselves, I'm a man of facts and I'm a man of clear thinking and these men actually were alive and well so we had the luxury of being considered about which of the options we had and how to sequence them in a way that didn't compromise the objectives 41 men home safe and no one hurt in the process so media of course jumped straight onto that um, I'm just saying, they're all coming home safe, and no one's going to get hurt, and they'll be home by Christmas. I think I actually said they were dancing for Diwali when they went in, and they'll be home to be singing for Christmas when they come out, which of course made everyone even more furious, because I'm being a bit evasive. And here's another example of the press where I'm saying they're all coming home. Now, can you imagine me as a professional person with my prior history saying that? Like, that is super, super high risk for me. But I believed it to be true. I, I felt that they were all coming home safe and we weren't going to hurt anybody. The bit I didn't say was, I don't know how. <laughs> right? I didn't know how. But I was confident that with so many great people in the room and the support from the full international community and with such a good spirit, we'd figure it out. Now, advice I sought from ITA, a team I did assemble of experts from around the world, not one in fear or tremble. Our nations rallied quick and fast, the ones that border too with commitments to help our tunnelers out, nothing too much for them to do. Without exception, all the member nations rallied behind me to do whatever they could to help. The, I'll give you a tangible example. The Italians, um, through TRE, got hold of the Japanese because they've got a satellite that could do um, historical LIDAR analysis of where the tunnel alignment was. And we just got for free historical LIDAR analysis. So we were able to conclude that there was no surface expression of what had happened, which was consistent with what we were seeing below. 
which was the a huge cavity was forming and it was active and we were seeing deformation um, in, in the area. So here's the thing I tell you true. I knew inside we get them out. With engineering and strength of heart, but with no time to muck about. Deep inside the mountain, warmed from earth below, the core of our planet building mountains, the warmth from down below. So, oh, it isn't there. I actually had a, I thought I had, as I was driving here, the um, time depth curve. Just to, to remind everyone that in a, particularly in an area here with such active tectonics, inside that mountain was warm. It wasn't cold. Actually, this place that the 41 people found themselves wasn't threatening in that they're going to freeze. Actually, the mountain was holding them warm. So I began to research the issues to see what I could find. So I turned to Professor Google, that great scholar of our time. Twas there I learnt some key facts that made my heart alive. A local god disturbed from sleep the portal temple being denied. So the local people believed that this was the wrath of the gods because the local deity was furious over a raised temple. Okay, so that, that was the local, the local belief. And so Professor Google shared some more about the, um, the Devhumi land of gods I go, a place of great enlightenment, the place all Hindu know. So I decided at that moment, I decided on the plane that my first stop before the tunnel inspection was prayer at the tunnel portal before my mission upon which I came. So here's the point that the media became interested in me. Uh, this, and can I say, um, I wasn't, I didn't, like I've just flown in. I'm, I'm not culturally sensitive. I just thought it was the right thing to do. And uh, in all cultures, there's uh, usually a, like a St. Barbara or something in which you say a prayer before you go underground because we, we know how dangerous it is. Like, we know. And for thousands of years, the generations of tunnelers before us know how dangerous it is and they've died because of it. So it's, it's proper to be a little humble when you go underground because we know how enormous the the forces and everything are. Can I say, this is an early shot, and how I know is I've still got my shoes on. Um, so after this shot on LinkedIn, people say, Sir, you should have your shoes off. I'm like, OK, I'll get the shoes off soon. So later when you see me, I've got my shoes off. So I asked amongst the nations, the ones I represent, our thoughts on how to get them out, an engineered design we duly sent. So I was contacted on day one and uh, amongst the team at ITA we put together an engineered solution uh, straight away just as an option and many options on the table. Now this event was quite odd, rather queer in fact, because despite an avalanche inside, all lives they were still intact. <laughs> I've never seen this before. My whole career is investigating disasters underground and always everyone's dead. Right? So this immediately struck me as a little odd because how is it that you have this huge, I don't know, million ton avalanche thing where the mountain hollows out its middle and we've got a, uh, it's still collapsing but there's no one dead. So this, this was something that had me thinking because Oh my goodness, it's another sign. Um, I'm not sure if that's at that moment if I'm meant to collapse and have a heart attack and die. as sort of the end of my career, the high point reached. So, so, yeah. And to make things somewhat more odd, to make them more surreal, a million tonnes of collapsed rock had spared a small pipe of steel. 
So through a pipe the mountain spared, through this pipe of steel, we pumped in air, water, medicine and rations for a meal. The Indian team assembled awesome, all experts Indian true, with some foreign pink ones, Patrick, Chris, Hassan and me, together all of us would figure out what to do. Okay, so a few, few scattered pink ones in there as well, uh, in amongst the team. 14 November, 38 days until Christmas. The first auger was installed, it began to do the task. It blew itself to pieces, destroyed itself real fast. This was the first lesson, the thing to make us think. Those men were not coming out fast. It would take longer than a blink. 15 November, 37 days until Christmas. NHIDCL were on it. A bigger machine they would get. An auger with big muscles, airlifted by Air Force on a jet. 16 November, 36 days till Christmas. The trenchless monster was assembled to do battle with the rock, but twisted steel was hidden deep in there and the avalanche base growing with falling rock. By 16 November, we realised the avalanche, the collapse, wasn't stopped. It was continuing. And the more we interfered with the ground, the bigger it was growing. And the cavity which was forming above the avalanche zone was unstable. 17 November, 35 days to Christmas. Progress began with tunnelling fast, 24 metres just to tease us. But then the sickening sound of cracking rock and steel encountered did cease it. 18 November, 34 days till Christmas. With August stopped and angered rock, multiple rescue strategies explored. All were on the table, none to be ignored. 19 November, 33 days till Christmas. Drilling was suspended the day they flew me in. So this is when I, I come in. The auger had some broken parts, needed fixing to begin. After a quick prayer, I went inside to see what I could see. Lesson one was simple. The scars of a traumatic tunnelling past, the scars of 21 collapses be. I walk in, as any of you would walk in, and I'm like, oh my God. Collapse after collapse after collapse. 21. So, out of my poetry, so if we're going to do something, collapses can't be normal, can't be business as usual. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, as we learn the behaviour of the rock. Not 21. Just for us, not on the media, okay? It's just, shh, shh, don't tell anyone I said that. 20 November, 34 days to Christmas. Up the mountain I did go to check out the rocks and more. A sheer zone lay above the roof like none I'd seen before. And if we were to drill from above, the rock, it must be good. So I needed to take a, lot, uh, take a look. The truth must be understood. 20 November, 34 days to Christmas. And in the place directly above the crown, 100 metres, maybe more, was a bed of competent rock, a place for drilling that was sure. The rock, it was like a gift, unlike others I had seen, for it was strong and true, and none others in those places I had seen. So you might have seen I go up the mountain, I'm doing the good old fashioned geology fieldwork thing like we do at uni, and there, exact, 
deeply above the crown is this really competent rock. Gone through all the shear zone, gone through all the other stuff, there's obviously all sorts of unconformities and things, but right above the tunnel, right where we want it to be, at one of the closest points vertically, is this really nice rock. But in my mind, I wondered, was this rock a bit, how's that? Could a hidden aquifer lie beneath? Could this be an angry mountain's trap? Because as technical people, we know <laughs> that we don't know. That's the whole humility of our job. We, we do all sorts of things. But I thought it was fantastic that this rock was there. But I'm like, I wonder if there's a trick. I wonder if there's something more to this. And while all this was going on, the mountain playing games, another lifeline tunnel, almost connected, then destroyed, much hope went up in flames. So we were drilling another lifeline tunnel to complement the, uh, the pipe that had been spared in the initial avalanche, and everything was going really well, and then it wasn't. And when we looked at the survey, the pipe went, was going through, going through, going through, going through. Everyone's like, yeah, we're going to have another pipe. And then it went boing and vertical. It's like, oh, not cool. 21 November, 33 days to Christmas. Success at last. A pipe is through. Our trapped tunnelers do we see. Hot food for them. And now families believe. For in this world of lies, when things are said untrue, for the first time all can see it's truth we've been telling you. So 21 November, the world sees that we're not telling lies, that everyone are alive. You can see them there. This is good. Well, it's sort of good, except it means that we've still got 41 lives and we need to get them home and we can't hurt anybody. And this is what you haven't heard before. But from the camera there was more information, things that before we did not know. That avalanche from day one had not stopped. On the trap side, we could see it grow. The tunnel was collapsing, a further avalanche quite near. The roof it was ripping out above our lifelines and quite near. So on the side where the workers were trapped, when they actually moved the endoscope camera around, we could see on what we would describe as the left side, so if the tunnel's behind me, it's on that side, we could see that the, the roof was collapsing and it was active and the miners were telling us, um, the tunnelers were telling us they were scared to go anywhere up there because it looked like it was about to blow. And that was exactly where our, our lifelines it's where all our pipes are. So, as technical people, all of us in the room going, right, okay, so they're all alive, and we've got two lifelines, but it's collapsing. So, how do we rescue them without triggering a second major event? And on the rescue side, above and to the left, so the same, we could sense things moving. It was not looking quite the best. A progressive a collapse we were sensing with drones and survey too. The mountain had not stopped moving. In fact, the change was accelerating. We knew our mission true. So we knew by this date that we had not a mountain moving into equilibrium, we actually were sensing an acceleration of change on either side of the collapse zone. So here's a picture. Of, um, this is just another example of the goodwill. This is a, a company called Squadron. They came in and just did LiDAR surveys for free. All right, and so this is just the drone um, doing its thing. And here's, like I'll just point to some stuff. So this is um, where the, the collapse, the collapse is actually sort of up at this end. And 
I, as I've, I've only written the poem and the presentation like literally this morning since I woke up and in the taxi, or sorry, the car, in the thank you Gupta family for actually helping me get all this done so fast. They've been very good, give me cups of teas. Um, number one son helping me edit because I was a bit tired. So yeah, thank you. So anyway, what, what this shows, and I've, if, if I had more time, I'd show you the change in time. This is where the um, collapse zone is. And what we were seeing on the left side was um, increasing rate and extent uh, of some sort of movement. Now, there was debate about whether or not it was significant or not significant. And there was debate about whether it was in the correct plane and whether it was properly characterised as convergence or not. But what it showed us was things were changing and the extent of change was extending up the tunnel well past where we were doing our emergency response. Uh, and it was threatening this area in here. And although I haven't got a slide on it, one of the responses, just for completeness, was we put um, steel ribs in and then attached them to the roof to at least try and secure that zone. Plus, we also um, brought in um, pipes and things so that if it collapsed, we'd have somewhere to run to. And also, if it collapsed, we could still perhaps maintain the horizontal pipe which we'd been drilling. So that was all going on. 22 November, 32 days to Christmas. With knowledge that the mountain was still unhappy and convergence threatening, everything we did was carefully discussed our, all our lives for the reckoning. So we carefully put the drillers up on top of the mountain. We prepared a horizontal drill for access horizontal to the mountain. We got ready a side drift plan with army at the ready, but most of all, we took a breath. We knew we must be steady. 23 November. This day is the great battle, the day humility was found, when that big auger machine of muscles was overcome by the ground. Despite the strength of 100 titans, despite its angry roar, its chassis ripped from the rock, and to silence it returned once more. It just basically blew itself up. 24 November, 32 days to Christmas. The auger, it lay dying, most parts now destroyed. My sense was that the mountain mused. The mountains laughed, not so much annoyed. So it was kind of a funny scene. It was like, huh, you reckon your, your trenchless machine can, can sort it out? Well, it's just, it basically lay in ruins. It's ripped itself out of the ground. It's augers all jammed up. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's in a mess. 25 November. So the team of fantastic people, with hearts remaining true, had now learned some great lessons, some lessons about what to do. We knew the mountain could collapse again at a random time if triggered. So we thought things through some more. Softly, softly was how we figured. 26 November, 30 days to Christmas. Two drills from above were launched, one smaller than the other. The small one was fast and true, as eyes for its larger 1200 rescue brother. For the smaller drill could check for sure if there was an aquifer of danger. The bigger one would follow slow and escape shaft for a vertical manger. But the risk of collapse was quite real. So the 1200 bore, it had to stop before it hit rock bolts of steel to ensure that not all was lost. Because the risk was that the drillers, with hearts strong and spirits true, might trigger another avalanche with little more that we could do. So. By 26 November, we've got the vertical drills coming down and approaching the men for a vertical interception of the tunnel crown. 
but the risk is that that interception could trigger a major avalanche in the section that the men are. And there's some details about whether they're in a section with both secondary lining and primary lining. But if, if it triggered it, we would lose the lifelines and we'd we don't, didn't know how far it would extend and that would complicate things. So because we were so focused on no one getting hurt and everyone coming out alive, we took the conservative decision to just pause and let's see what we can do for the, in the horizontal section. And I'm not sure if I click it again whether this will work. Oh, yeah. This is, uh, we're using the piling machine to put the 1200 uh, rescue shaft in. And I'm not really worried about x at all. Like, oh. okay. So that's us. That's the 1200 machine going down and it was doing a beautiful job and a lot of care and attention to the rotary, um, the rotary tools that were caught so that it minimised the transmission of vibration through the ground and we had geophones and everything set up with active monitoring and then we had an army group who was coordinating all of the, um, the data coming together so we could relate activity at each place to any observations at any other location. So we're getting... We're getting smart, we're getting sensitive now. Balancing. 27 November. So the stage was set for something gentle, something slowly from the start. My dear friend designed and building a special rock extraction cart. So I wished I had his photograph here, lovely guy, genius the night before, down in the metalworking area, building the little cart that we would use to bring the rocks, which are extracted by hand, out um, just to help everybody. Because, of course, safety was really important and we didn't want anyone hurt. The rescue was not hurt. Now, the new plan, it was quite simple, just 100 millimetres at a time. By hand, brave men would take out the rock by hand, one piece at a time. Twas the night before Christmas. When, when all the house, hang on, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. I inspected the mountain, I checked things down below, I was finally content, I felt good, we were good to go. 28 November. I slept like a lamb through that night. The first sleep I'd really got. The stage was set, all things be right. In calmness, these 40 when, 41 men could be got. And um, there's my sleeping place. So secretly, I'd arrange with the army in their tents to sleep because that way I could do the work at night and check all the factual things and I didn't have to worry about getting a car to go back to the hotel. But I didn't confess this until after the rescue because there was some concern that it was inappropriate for me to be staying in the army camp. But actually it was really cool. It's like a little boy's dream. Oh, I'm going to be an army man now. So I was down there in the, in the camp with the guys and that was really cool. Upon my head, the hat I wore was the yellow helmet from the auger cutters. I wore it in solidarity for all the yellow hats, trap ones and all the others. So you'll see in any of the media, I swap from a white hat to a yellow hat. That hat I got from the head of the auger cutters and then I'd also taken it to the little temple and I had it blessed as well. And there were several messages in that which were really important. And for the workers on our side, the rescue side, I was communicating to them, hey, look, I'm not a white hat anymore, I'm a yellow hat. I'm one of you guys, okay? We're getting your friends out from the other side and we're all in this together. So there's actually a whole lot of communication going on just in, in my helmet. I watched my back upon the wall. I watched them all come out. It gave me joy to watch them jump amongst the cheering and the shouting out. So this is... So 
So, yes, yeah, so I'm actually behind all the families. And it was interesting, despite all the shouting, the families were just really quiet because to me it looked like they couldn't believe that their loved ones were alive still. They were actually really quiet and I was just sitting on the rocks behind with my back against the wall. So, as promised, um, they're all out after 17 days, but the story doesn't end there. My job was not completed. Some things were left undone. I was commanded to a chopper, but in another direction, I did run. A chance meeting with Mr. Kulvi, I explained my need to give thanks. He winked at me and wished me well on what I must do, like schoolboys playing pranks. So at the hotel, quite by chance, I come down. I've got on my phone the command to go to the chopper, the chopper place. I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do that. And I told him my dilemma, and I said, look, I really feel I can't, I can't leave yet. And he's like, no worries. He, he got it. So, and there, there he is there. And there's also um, Pakshit, um, Colonel Pakshit. We were all working as a, a great team. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that was just us up to mischief. So 29 November. So SDRF and I launched the final rescue plan to the High Mountain Temple, our mission, a merry group of happy man a dancing and singing happy band. First, to the family that gave me flowers, I thank them from the bottom of my heart. They were pleased to see me again. Their flowers always smart. So this was just back at the garden of one of the, this house that would always let me go to their, their house and get flower and I would choose like before, oh, I can sort of see it in the picture there. So. This was the day after the rescue, so I chose flowers the same colour as the rescue colours. Um, and anyway, they're just lovely. So if you haven't been up there yourself, the people up there are just so nice. Next was to the temple above the tunnel true. And my goodness, what a place to go. You just can't believe the view. And then back down we went, our singing and dancing team, we had a crack at Bollywood fame, our dance video much loved and seen. I know, you're all jealous. My movies are pretty good. <laughs> we had the best day. I've got to say, this was the best day of my life. Because those rescue guys from the SDRF and me, our careers are filled with pulling out bodies. And we didn't. The bodies, everyone just walked out. So, um, still not done. So I missed my chopper of the day before. I missed my flight to Delhi too. <laughs> But I'd had the best day of my life. I was so relaxed and contented too. Now at Derridan, unbeknown to me, 
was a surprise quite unexpected, a big surprise you'll see. The men that I had helped rescue, those men I'd never met, were waiting for their first flight with me on the same jet. And now it gets really funny. So we get on the jet, and where do you think the airline puts them? In front of the exit row. <laughs> and so now I get into trouble from the airline lady, because she's there going, are rich you men happy to, uh, in an emergency, uh, use the exit row? I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> Give them a break. <laughs> like, these guys can burrow out of your jet whether or not they've got an emergency door there or not. And so, we, I just thought this was so funny. So the moral of this story, a fact that's surely true, is kind people can do anything when together their hearts are true. No matter which God you worship or the colour of your skin, no matter your language and culture, no matter the politics, or sin. No matter of anything, in fact, there is just one thing that's true. We good people of the world can do anything in friendship true. And my friends, that's my take. <laughs> Perhaps not the technical presentation you're expecting, but uh, um, that's, that's all written this morning since a, a sleep. And again, thanks to Rahul Gupta and his family for helping me with uh, just feeding me cups of tea and leaving me sitting there typing away. So, yeah, thank you. Is that... I'm good? Yep. I know it's a bit hard to know when I'm finished because it's a bit weird. I mean, it's not exactly... I didn't even discuss um, support classes, didn't mention The Rock. Didn't do any of that. I could have, but I thought this was better. Uh, now I request Professor Manna to extend our gratitude for the very informative and engaging presentation by Mr. Arnold Dix by giving a moment to as a token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, thank you. So, do I? Thank you very much. Uh, we have now our next presentation, Industrial Lecture 2, by Mr. Sanjeev Gupta uh, on the topic of challenges and mitigation measures, tunnel construction. So Mr. Sanjeev Gupta graduated in civil engineering from Devi Ahilla Vishwavidyala in the Indoor with a master's degree in the Water Resource Department from IIT Roorkee. He has more than 30 years of experience in the field of hydropower project. He joined SJVN Limited in 1993 and has been involved in the investigation of the hydro project, detailed planning and design of several hydro projects. He has also been associated with the design and planning of Nakta Jakri HEP. Uh, Rampur HEP, Sunni Dam HEP, and uh, Dhalasid HEP, Aduntri HEP, Natiwar Modi HEP, and Lodi Stage 1 HEP. Currently, he has been heading the Civil Engineering Department at Corporate, head, uh, corporate Headquarters and looking after all the hydro and 
pump storage project in SNI and construction stage. So welcome, sir. Thank you very much, uh, esteemed speakers from different countries, distinguished delegates, and uh, IIT management. I thank you again. The, my presentation is challenges and mitigation measures, tunnel construction. So this is a structure of the presentation, SGVN at a glass, uh, then major challenges faced and mitigation measures taken during the construction of two headrest tunnels, Nathwa Chakri and Rampur. In the earlier, uh, in the morning session, our CMD told that we have faced very challenges in hot water zone, shear zone, thrust zone. Uh, both these projects have different type of geological features and we tackled them successfully and both projects are now under operation. So SJVN, was uh, incorporated. It is a joint venture of Government of India and Government of Himachal Pradesh. It's, it was incorporated on 24th May. Shareholding pattern, it is 55% of Government of India, 27% uh, Government of HP, and 18% public. So installed capacity, uh, 2122 megawatt of eight power stations, out of which three hydro projects uh, 1942 are contributing and rest is from solar and wind. The total project for portfolio is uh, 58,000. Uh, we are, uh, the 85 projects are in Kitty. And transmission line, five number lines are having the portfolio and two already constructed. Subsidiaries, four subsidiaries, SEPDAC, uh, SLAPDC, SGPL, SGL, these all subsidiaries of SJBN operating different projects. Joint venture, CPTC. So this is a brief about our uh, portfolio. Under operation, eight projects. Under construction, 13 projects. Under pre-construction, 20 projects. Under survey and investigation, 18 projects. Under allotment, 26 projects. Total, 85 projects, magnitude of 58,000 mega megawatt and five transmission lines. So I am coming to the presentation. The tackling of shear zone in Nathwa Jakari and hot water zone. You can see the diagram. Just uh, shear zone. You can see the shear zone. Uh, um, just upstream of Ratanpur edit, this is being uh, tackled, and hot water zone, uh, just uh, downstream of Badhal, two points. And apart from this, uh, in the Mangalad edit, we uh, uh, lining uh, con uh, this crossing, uh, this crossing, uh, low, low level, low uh, cover crossing was done with steel liner in for Mangalad edit. So, in this uh, Mangala, uh, Ratanpur uh, edit, Class 6 rock was encountered, heavy sip, uh, water seepage, weak geological uh, crust biotracist rock mass was encountered. Rock mass in shear zone was highly crust and variable uh, and running sub parallel to the tunnel axis. It was uh, worst conditions were prevailing. Uh, rock at face disintegrated into sand size particles with passage of time and behaving like cosinless low strength crust material. This resulted in a cons considerable overbreak and uncontrollable raveling. So movement was also observed at 8 centimeter. So uh, with the advice of uh, panel of experts and site conditions, dress methodology was proposed. And dress uh, abbreviation, you can see drainage, reinforcement, excavation, support, and solution. Uh, this uh, was uh, adopted to tackle shear zone. And firstly, uh, the major uh, thing is to how to drain out the area because heavy seepage was there. So 77 mm dia drill hole pipes were provided. And thereafter, uh, arch uh, MS pipe, steel arch umbrella was provided with this uh, 12 meter long and 114, 114 meter dia cement grouted MS pipe. 
Face was excavated with pin hammer, with, uh, just to accommodate one rib at a time. Top heading excavation was carried one meter below the springing level, half ring, leaving central portion to brace the face, and walls against collapsing and excavated round of 0.75 to this. This method was adopted. You can see the picture, face collapsed at uh, uh, heading Ratanpur. Just you can see the, this uh, diagram. This, uh, this, these are the drainage holes and four poles, and uh, this inclination was five to eight degree. F 30, uh, 50, meter, 50 mm thick short kids was applied. Uh, steel rib sections, ISMB 300 was applied. Uh, 25 mm, uh, six meter long footing anchor were also provided just to support the base so that force uh, ribs are not disturbed. Three meter overlap in succeeding four poles set to avoid any face collapse. By adopting this whole length, this shear zone was uh, occurred in the length of about 355 meters. This was tackled. Then thereafter, uh, in the Badhal portion, uh, and downstream of Badhal, in the HRT only, high temperature ranging from 40 degree to 66 degree was encountered at different locations in a length of 3.5 kilometer. So, this, this observation of uh, uh, 100, 100 uh, LPS was observed. Complete stoppage of work for two months. Augmentation in uh, existing dewatering system. Installation of ice, ice, wall, ice plant was installed and th this, these measures were taken. So you can see the photograph. In the photograph, hot water ingress you can see uh, just and ingress of hot water uh, this made very tough condition to work in the uh, tunnel. Measures adopted for concrete lining with the help of CSMRS, uh, this design was done and OPC with uh, fly ash and maximum water cement ratio was controlled and this, this measures were taken for the concrete lining portion. So preparation of, uh, for hot water zone inside the HRT after the breakthrough of the tunnel Badhal and, uh, between Badhal and Manglad edits. So circulation of the air, natural circulation of the air gets started. Prior to that, prior to that, uh, working conditions were very tough. Steel plate shutter gate was also installed, uh, uh, was erected in HRT near the Badhal junction at high, uh, higher, higher elevation. Three ventilation fans of higher capacity, 200 kV, were uh, installed in, in, uh, for the air, to reverse air circulation. Our aim was to uh, get uh, 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 hot air out of uh, this. Uh, circulation and uh, to get the fresh air inside the tunnel. Trapping of CPS water by fixing the ferrules and pipes, also for the drainage, trapping of CPS water, and this was made. Uh, reduced working hours of labor like dumper operator. This is very uh, important. Actually, one uh, labor could work only uh, one round of mucking in a day, in an eight hour shift um, with an ice block inside cabin of the dumper. You can imagine how much uh, temperature, how tough the working environment was. This. And ice plant of 30 metric ton per day capacity was installed. Uh, and uh, this was placed for lowering the temperature inside the tunnel. So you can see the uh, Rampur. Uh, next project is our Rampur project. The, this is in tandem with the Nathwa Jhakri project. Uh, you can see the thrust zone just uh, upstream of this uh, uh, Kajo edit. And uh, you can see uh, cavities, two cavities. This, this, this is a layout of the HRT. So length, HRT length is 15 kilometer and diameter 10.5 meter with uh, and six edits. This is the photograph of the surface power house of Rampur project, which is under operation. So challenges, uh, just I highlighted heavy CPS and thrust tune in Kajo upstream, cavity in Kasoli and cavity in Gosai. So you can see the heavy CPS and thrust zone. It was also in the regional geological map. This was predicted prior to this uh, uh, excavation. Heavy CPS was observed. Later on, uh, the tunnel got flooded and discharge increased suddenly to 300 LPS, liter per second. CPS water temperature was 33 degree and 35 degree. You can see the raw condition indicated face collapse due to swelling nature of the, this, and reverse slope was there in the edit, so dewatering arrangement was also made. You can see the picture, heavy CPS at, uh, of water at the face, 
showing flooding in HRT. This, uh, you can see the flooding of HRT. Heavy CPS and thrust zone. You can see this uh, fractured rock and uh, rock fall uh, just uh, after the heavy CPS, uh, showing highly oxidized and fragmented debris. You, you see the picture. So these are another picture uh, showing crown and face, uh, showing rock fall as face. So five number, what we did, five number additional debartering pumps of 60 uh, horsepower capacity were installed. Heavy CPS was controlled with the injection of the PU grout and uh, grouting holes of dia were drilled. Periphery holes were also drilled at an angle of 30 degree to 35 degree. Two materials were used, use U-rests and uh, this uh, resin and uh, base. So these were mixed. And you can see the, uh, how tough the working environment there for just PU grouting is being done in hot and heavy CPS conditions. So this heavy CPS uh, uh, shifted. And when we did the PU grouting, the dry portion, left side got dry and uh, right side uh, got wet. So working was done in a controlled manner. First le uh, left side was tackled and then right side. So heavy CPS and thrust zone. Uh, this, uh, uh, before uh, uh, next advance, two pro holes were also drilled, just to know the geology in advance. You can see the machines. Uh, just, uh, these are the logs, uh, highly fragmented rock, and uh, this, this was in the thrust zone. So heavy CPS and thrust zone. Uh, as predicted, thrust zone encountered, uh, and mainly with hydraulic hammer. Sports system inside short kit over wire mesh, was layered in, uh, was placed in layers. You can see just uh, wire mesh was placed with short kit was done and not complete uh, any, just to relieve the uh, pore pressure, this was done and short kitting after then to amend drips. After core drilling, 11 meter HRT was excavated and suitable support system and thrust zone of 37 meter was tackled and crossed. You can see the picture. Cavity, uh, next is our, uh, uh, in the Rampur project, one more cavity was occurred in downstream of Kusoli edit. The reach between Kurni and Gosai edit, uh, it was uh, quite long reach, was six kilometer, due to weak, weak uh, geology, and to reduce the construction time, additional Kusoli edit was in, introduced during the construction stage. Weak geology encountered at certain RT, and excavation was uh, carried out with twin cutters. To prevent sliding uh, clefts of face, a rock pillar in the center was left. Just it was left uh, just uh, to provide the support system on the sides, sides and uh, to have a face to avoid the face clefts. You can see the twin cutter uh, just uh, working on the side, and rock ledge in between was kept for stabilization. Uh, during HRT excavation, reach from RD 54 the clefts and tunnel, uh, this just you see, uh, this uh, ribs and this, this uh, uh, cavity formation and uh, extensive cement grouting was carried to strengthen the reach. So it, in the, that situation, uh, bypass tunnel was proposed. This is the original edit. And uh, this is the cavity, uh, uh, this is the area where cavity was formed. And you can see by, bypass edit was constructed just uh, to uh, reduce, uh, not to make the impact on the schedule. So this, she, uh, this zone was tackled from this side on this side also, and this uh, was completed timely. You can see the drift, uh, uh, how it was uh, tackled, this uh, zone, this uh, upper drift and side drifts were provided. Multi-drift, uh, one uh, drift of dimension around two meter was excavated at the crown and left hand side and uh, left hand side and right hand side drifts were also and the space between the ribs uh, between the two drifts was manually excavated and supported by steel ribs one by one this was followed up to certain rd rd so you can see next pic picture so uh, after the drift uh, d shaped gullet was also uh, done 5 meter dia pre grouting was also uh, done uh, to strengthen the forward face step by manual cutting rib erection work was carried out in drifts for uh, from rd68 excavation in d safe gullet was done you can see the breakthrough next uh, this is the breakthrough when the drift uh, after the drift gullet was uh, d shape gullet was there drift from bypass junction upstream side you can view this 
This method was followed till successfully breakthrough of the cavity. So another uh, third in the Rampur, we faced uh, 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 upstream of Gosai edit, rock fall occurred uh, in the upstream of uh, uh, this Gosai edit at Sutton RD and the uh, latest girder with short crit including sufficient rock walls were provided before this rock. So this was the area which was impacted. You can see latest girder and this all were damaged and debris fallen down and muck debris, no single boulder. You can see the debris is very uh, fractured. Methodology uh, to treat the cavity, removal of muck, damaged latest girders and four poles. Application of thick layer of short kit in cavity, erection of steel sets, ISHB 150 was employed. So you can, uh, four poles were uh, also apl applied for the safety of the workers to advance further. So 100 mm steel uh, pipes skin to skin were made. So what are the taken uh, uh, takeaways? Rich experience and expertise gained in tackling problems such as cavities, thrust zone, hot zone, uh, low, low cover reaches in the tunnels of Nathwachakri and Rampur. We utilize this experience uh, in the, uh, we are utilizing this experience in the Arun 3 and Natwar Muri also. This experience is also being utilized for our under construction projects, Sunni, Dhalasit, and Luri. This experience gained uh, will help also in upcoming projects of SAVN, particularly in Arunachal Pradesh, Nepal, and Chenab Basin of Himachal Pradesh. So during uh, underground excavation in young uh, Himalayan region, encountering weak rock, hot water zone, shear and thrust zone pose risk. So possible reaches inside the tunnel can be identified during geological mapping or latest te technology, geological mapping and this uh, geophysical survey, etc. And uh, this, this can be done. Preparation of material machinery, including standard operating pressures, should be in place if such type of situation arises. Tackling of cavity shall start immediately after uh, to avoid any further versioning. So this is all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I request Professor B. Manna, sir to extend our gratitude for the enlightening talk by Mr. Sanjeev Gupta by giving a moment as a token of appreciation. Thank you, sir. So now we have a, uh, the third keynote lecture by Dr. Rajneesh Kumar Goel. Uh, Dr. Rajneesh Kumar Goel was a chief scientist and was in charge of CSIR CIMF Art Regional Center, Rurki, and is now a tunnel design advisor. He is an expert in engineering geology, rock mechanics, and underground space technology. He was work on more than 60 tunneling and mining projects and developed new tunneling technologies and correlations. He was received several prestigious awards, such as National Mineral Awards and the IIT Roorkee Gopal Ranjan Research Award and the Elsevier Outstanding Researcher Award, Reviewer Award. And he was authored five books and published more than 140 research papers in reputed journals and conference proceedings. He is a member of various professional society and committees related to rock mechanics and tunneling. He is a highly respected and accomplished scholar and practitioner in this field. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, we are honored to have him in this uh, forum, and uh, now I will come uh, Dr. Goel for the presentation. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my hearty thank to IIT Delhi and SJVNL, especially Professor Ramana and Professor Shirole from IIT Delhi and uh, Mr. Akshay Acharya, Head Geology from SJVNL, for extending their invitation for this talk. So I have been asked by the organizers to discuss about deformation measurements and support assessment during tunnel excavation. Now I have planned the lecture in three parts. 
In part one, I will briefly discuss about the basic theory, briefly on the stress, the stress redistribution, the zone of influence around the tunnel, longitudinal deformation along the tunnel axis, and then some equations to estimate the deformation. Part two, basics about the instrumentation, and part three, evaluation and optimization of supports, some case studies. Now, you all know that the in-situ stresses, which are generally the vertical stress to horizontal stresses, these stresses got disturbed when we excavate a tunnel. And in the process, in the process of redistribution of the stresses, we get induced stresses around the tunnel opening. And these are generally referred, represented by sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. During this redistribution of the stresses, the rock mass starts moving inside the tunnel. Because that is the only place, empty place, where the rock mass can move in the process of the redistribution of the stresses. So the formation of the rock mass depends upon the ground, means the rock mass type, and the in-situ stresses, and the tunnel size. Apart from the convergence of the tunnel periphery, the, the deformation within the rock mass away from the tunnel periphery is equally important to be known sometimes when the rock mass is heterogeneous or some weak zones are present. I will discuss one case study to highlight this issue. This deformation oblique convergence, we can, someone can also call it convergence or the deformation of rock mass in the tunnel is an important factor. You will come to know as I proceed during my presentation that how the deformation and its measurement is very important for the stability or for the safe excavation of the tunnel. Now coming to the zone of influence, now you see, in this, this is your tunnel, and this is the zone of the rock mass influenced around the tunnel because of this opening. There will be no effect of tunnel excavation beyond a point, beyond a point here, there will be no effect of tunnel ex excavation inside, a, inside the rock mass. At this point, beyond this zone of influence, at this point, around the opening, all this, at this point, the in-situ stresses would remain unaffected due to tunneling. The zone of up to which the in-situ stresses are disturbed because of tunnel excavation is known as the zone of influence as shown the shaded portion here in this, around this tunnel opening. The rock mass in the zone of influence Depending upon the rock mass properties, induced stresses, you see, I'm talking about the induced stresses are here, because the in situ stresses are changed into the induced stresses. And the tunnel size would deform and thus affect, uh, that's affected by the tunnel excavation. The rock mass deformation, the rock mass deformation would be maximum at the tunnel periphery. At the tunnel peri periphery, it will be maximum. And negligible at the boundary of the influence zone. And beyond the boundary of the influence zone, there, here, there will be no effect of the tunnel. Now, coming to the deformation profile along the tunnel, see, this is the face of the tunnel. This is already excavated, and we are moving this direction. So there is variation in deformation ahead and behind the moving tunnel face of an unsupported tunnel. Measurable displacement in the rock mass begins at a distance of about one half a tunnel diameter d by 2 
ahead of the phase. So the displacement, in fact, starts ahead of the tunnel phase. The effect of tunneling is started beyond the tunnel phase. And the amount and the distance, this may increase further depending upon the, the stresses and the rock mass type. The displacement increases gradually, and when the tunnel phase is coincident with the measuring point, the radial displacement is about one third of the maximum value here. It is expected that it will be around one third of the total deformation value, value even at the tunnel phase. That means when you are, you are at, up to at a tunnel phase, already one third of the expected deformation has taken place. The displacement in general reaches a maximum when the phase has progressed about one and one half to two tunnels diameter. So we say about 3D, 3 by D, 3D by two tunnel diameter. Here, the maximum deformation has taken place. That means beyond this point, there should not be any further displacement because of the movement of the tunnel phase. But you see, we have measured that the tunnel deformation has remained continued even up to 20 times the tunnel diameter in the US BRL tunnels. Even in Shibro Kohdri tunnel long back, we have measured that the tunnel deformation remains continued for about 26 months. So this can be different type of conditions. I will come to that later. So at 3D by 2, the support provided by the face is no longer effective. This is, this is, this is in general. It is considered in general. Now, the deformation oblique displacement is because of the incremental step of tunnel advance and time of placement of the supports. So time of placement of the support is also very important, especially in weaker rock masses. And you know the stand-up time concept is there then. The deformation is related to the, to the creep potential of the surrounding rock mass also. So in creep rocks where we have creep behavior there, it's not necessary that we will get the effect up to three by three times the tunnel diameter by two. It can be longer, as I've told you earlier. In case of Chivro Khodri tunnel, in case of US BRL tunnel, we have measured the deformation even for longer distances of the face. In tunneling, time-dependent behavior creep is often observed in weak rock masses that exhibit squeezing conditions. The creep behavior may extend through the initial construction period and beyond. The time effect can, can contribute up to 70% because of time, right? The displacement can be up to 70% of the total deformation, as had been suggested by Sulam and his co workers in 1987. The rock mass may behave differently under different conditions and would require supports for stability. Now you see there I have plotted three with the, with the phase advance. This, suppose if you are getting this type of curve, it, it, it reflects you that your tunnel is uh, stable. But in this case, it is with support, it can be stable. But in this case, showing the rising trend continuously of the formation, that means this is unstable. I will again explain this with, by, with the help of another figure. Now coming to the deform estimations, there are a number of correlations to estimate the deformation. Before you are really planning the excavation, you can estimate the deformation, that how much deformation is expected. And this is very important in your, uh, while you are excavating the tunnel for, you know, for applying the observ observational method. Or you can call it the anatium, build as you go. So for applying that, this is a very important, you must know what the deformations are expected in your tunnel. So there are various correlations. Panet and Gwinnett, they have prop uh, proposed this for elastic condition. Corbeta, for this is empirical correlation, right? This is the, the UR upon, this is maximum displacement. UR is the deformation at particular distance, 
and URM is the maximum deformation expected. And then how et al has pro uh, proposed this expression where alpha is depending upon the, the overburden pressure, PO, which is gamma H, and this is the rock mass rating, RMR. And this is beta, beta is again the, uh, depending upon the RMR. And what is, who can, who can tell they have found that alpha and beta, this value, alpha 1.1, beta 1.7 for the best fit curve of this expression. Now I have proposed this, these two correlations for one for non-excusing condition where we expect the tunnel deformation less than 1% or equal to 1% of the tunnel size and this one is for excusing condition where we expect the tunnel deformation more than 1% of the tunnel size. Now coming to another slide of deformation estimation, this is proposed by Barton and his co-workers, Barton in 2008 and then Barton and Grimstad in 2014. They have proposed this, this correlation uh, that is span upon Q, right? So for, for vertical one, span the, the width of the opening, 100 to normalize sigma C, then sigma V and sigma C is the UCS of intact rock. For wall, height of the opening like this, and they have, they have you know, validated this in case of Natma Jhakri and Vezer in the Zovik cavern. Hook et al. has proposed some analytical uh, equations to estimate the uh, deformation. Now coming to the part two of the presentation. Now you all agree with me that tunnel instrumentation and monitoring helps in quantifying and, um, or, or the measuring the deformation, the pressures, and all, all other parameters of which, which we, we really want to measure and which, we re, which is going to help in optimizing the support. It helps in verifying uh, the designs and evaluating the support system. Instrumentation also helps in developing new correlations and guidelines backed by the in-situ field measurements. And that's how we get the empirical correlations. We got the empirical correlation to estimate support pressure using Q, to estimate support pressure using RMR. So these are all backed by the field measured values. Important for the success of NATM and for safe tunnel construction. So the importance uh, is that we should try to, develop, to turn the data which we get from the instruments to turn data into an useful information. This should be our aim when we go for the instrumentation in any project. It should not be like that, that we are just measuring it and just keeping in the file. No. We should try to use the data for that project itself, for the benefit of that project. Now, what could be the type of measurements? The rock closure, convergence, or deformation. Generally, nowadays, we use BRT. And the one is the new coming technology that is distributed fiber optic sensors, DFOS. This is new, yet to implement in India. And I will just highlight about it in one slide. Deformation measurement within the rock mass surrounding the tunnel within the rock mass using multi-point borehole extension meter. Again, I will briefly discuss about it with one case history. And I am not going to discuss about the load and stresses because the, the paper, the, the, the lecture is mainly concentrating on the deformation measurement. Bioreflex targets at more location can be installed because it, 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 it is not that much costly, okay? So at the end, we can get very good information direct information using by reflect target. Now, we should try to have one or two typical cross sec uh, typical instrumentation section in a tunnel where we really, with the help of the geologist, we should select the, info, the, the location for having a typical detailed instrumentation section. 
where we can have all sort of informations. And with this various type of instruments, it can be pressure cells, the load cells, the BRTs or the tape extensometer targets. We should always, I'm emphasizing again, that we should not neglect the information like geology, Map mapping fracture spacing, orientation, width, fracture zone, alteration in groundwater. We should have Q, RMR, and GSI value of the location we have installed the instruments because all these information are very informed in, uh, useful at the time of analysis of the data. Similarly, we should know about the, the, the orientation of the institute stresses. We must know the overburden so that we can get the idea of the overburden stress. So time lag, we must also know the time lag between excavation and installation of instruments. I have shown you the longitudinal displacement profile because you see at the tunnel face itself, we have seen that at the tunnel faces that the one third of the deformation have already taken place. So that means if we are delaying our installation of the uh, bi-reflex targets, that means we are missing a lot of information. Now, bi-reflex targets are fixed at regular intervals in tunnels to monitor the displacement, convergence of tunnel roof and wall. X, Y, Z coordinates were measured. And MPBX, these are bi-reflex target, right? This will measure the deformation of the place where it is installed, whereas MPBX is, are installed in the borehole, okay? And we can have number of anchors here, so therefore it is multi-point borehole extension meter. So it, it depends upon on, on how many locations around the opening, around the tunnel, we want to measure the displacement. And I want to highlight here you one thing, that we must always, whenever we use MPBX, we must always put bi-reflex target on the mouth, mouthpiece of the MPBX. Because from that, we will come to know the, the, the absolute displacement of the mouthpiece of the MPBX. Because otherwise, you see, whatever this displacement we will measure here will be with respect to the mouthpiece. So if we are, we are not having the absolute displacement of the mouthpiece, we will not be able to know the displacement, the absolute displacement of that particular depth where we have fixed that anchor. Now coming to distributed fiber optic sensor, DFOS. So this is a, a typical array of the, the, the fiber optic cable, which, is, which can be you know, laid, uh, this I have shown in precast uh, concrete segment. And this is, this is their interrogator. Interrogator is nothing but the readout. And they call it BOFDA. This is a frequency, uh, frequency do, uh, domain analyzer. Uh, this is with data acquisition uh, system. Now some important issues which I could uh, gather from various papers. It needs, the, the, it, the cable needs to be, the, the, the fiber optic cable needs to be calibrated to know the strain and temperature coefficient of the cable. It measures strains and temperature along entire cable or at set location to compensate uh, temperature effects. This is good, really good, as I could find out. This is good for continuous long-term monitoring. Needs protection because this is very sensitive, fiber optic, so it needs protection while embedding in concrete or the shortcrete. This has automated measuring system and therefore no direct access is required as in case of the tape extension meter, a person should go there and then measure, right? So it can have cable coming out of the tunnel and you can have the measurement at the portal itself. And accuracy is plus minus two micro uh, meter per meter and temperature accuracy 0.2 degree Celsius. This is not much popular as on today. Limited expertise is available and there are limited use in Austria, Austria and Germany 
not yet in India. And I, I came to know that this BOFDA, the interrogator itself, is costing around, say, 75 lakhs of rupees. Now, you see, I have told you about the mist deformation, because the day we have excavated the tunnel, we cannot install the, our bi-reflex tar target on the same day. It can be two days delayed, three days, four days. So, see, suppose this is the day of installation, okay, and we have got this type of curve. This is tunnel deformation and the time in days. And the, def the excavation has taken place see, 10 days before the day of installation. Now you see the trend, this is the, the exponential trend. So how to get the, how to get the missed deformation? We were just trying to uh, look into it. So what we, if you, if you, if you ex back extrapolate like this, right? So there may, there may be some error, chances of error. So what have we have done that you plot on log scale, right? Semi-logarithm, and then you will get that this initial one is having the straight line trend. A straight line you can easily back extrapolate up to the date of excavation, and then you can find out the missed deformation. You would add this missed deformation to this deformation to get the overall uh, deformation value. Now, this is uh, I've taken from a BIS code. These are the limits which I have taken from the BIS code. Action, and this is very important, you know, when you are measuring at site, so what action should be taken at what time? And action on the basis of deformation measurements is very much important. If timely action on strengthening of primary support is not taken, there can be instability problems leading to roof falls, apart from encroaching the tunnel size. And there are number of cases where, you see, because of the deformations, especially in squeezing conditions, because of high order of deformations, the tunnel has encroached the required size, right? And when, when we were going for the lining, we have to trim the, trim the or we have to reprofile it as they were doing in case of silk ara tunnel. So in the process, what is happening is that you are disturbing the, the equilibrium state of the stresses, okay? So that means you are, you are you know, with high deformation, you are already on the bottom point of the ground reaction curve with, with removing that or disturbing again. So that means you are, you are, you are destabilizing the ground. And if you are not having proper planning of reprofiling, then you may end up with some collapse. In areas where large deformations are observed, though in control manner, the roof and walls need to be trimmed to get the space for secondary lining. A dual level action plan for timely remedial measures is generally used. One is attention limit, another is the alarm limit. It is a percentage of the predicted deformation on exceeding this level, right? The frequency of reading shall be increased. Okay. This should be increased. The trigger limit is set to study the deformation trend more closely and take countermeasure if the deformation remain continue with the same speed to the alarm or the level. Generally, this is around 60 to 70 percent of the alarm limit. And alarm limit is the limit is generally set around 90 to 94 percent of the final estimated deformation value. Now coming to part three, evaluation and optimization of support, some case histories. Now you see here, this is showing the stable tunnel trend. This is continuously riding, rising trend with the same speed. That means uh, we should have some strengthening measure of the support. And this one is rising trend with high rate of deformation. 
more alarming condition. And here you see, in this case, it was showing less this thing, but again here the rising trend. This shows either benching excavation effect or some nearby, some another disturbing uh, effect or maybe sometimes uh, because of the nearby tunnel, if you have like parallel tunnels, maybe because of the excavation in the nearby tunnel and the effect of that, if, it's, if parting is not much. Now, you see the effect of invert closure. This is, this I have taken from the low tack tunnel. This is face uh, advance versus by tunnel radius and this is load and closure. Up to this point, no invert was there and when invert was installed, you see, it has stabilized. So this is in weaker rock masses, invert is very important. Weaker rock masses with high horizontal in situ stresses. And this is one example which I am talking about, the use of MPBX. You see, very, very classical example. And we have, we have used here the multi-point borer extension meter from the surface because the, this was installed in the drift, okay? And we want to know the effect of widening of the large cavern, okay, how the, this, the, there was a one agglomerate band. It, we want to know the behavior of the, the contact of the band with the host basalt. Here we have installed the MPBX. These were the MPBX supplied by PMT, Progressive Machine Tools. Those days this was known as PMT, but now it is PMT Infrast Science, and now they have very good state-of-the-art equipment available in our country. So you see here in this, sir, another two minutes, not more than that. So you see here the, 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 the relative displacement between anchor one and two between one anchor one and two the, of this band. See, this is rising very uh, high rate, but this one is very interesting that this is rising but with a very low rate. But if you consider the life of the opening, this which is about 100 meter, 100 years, so if we allow this much rising trend, so you, this is going to fail. So at this point, we have taken a decision to apply longer rock bolts so that we can stitch both the contacts. So we have applied longer rock bolts, and after that, you see, it has stabilized. So this is very good example, and this work has been praised, appreciated by the World Bank also, because this was the World Bank funded, funded project. Now coming to another one, the Chanani Nashri one. You see, heading excavation on 812, bench target installation 912, next day, and zero reading 1012. That is after two days, it has been started. And the support rock class, uh, B1, Attention limit 48 millimeter, alarm limit 60 millimeter. You see, it has crossed. This T2 and T4 has crossed both the attention as well as alarm limit. So it has indicated that now, but, but you see the rate has reduced. Up to here, the rate was at the same, but here, the rate has reduced. So at this point, the larger uh, bolts and the, the spacing of the bolts and the thickness of the short kit has increased, and after that, it has stabilized. Another very good example of the same tunnel, you see, there we have mixed rock, uh, murray formation, sandstone, mudstone, claystone, and UCS, you see, sandstone 70 to 120 MPA, sand, silty stone 25 to 40 MPA, claystone 8 to 15 MPA. We have installed here the targets, and here you see, on the roof, you will find the clay stone, then sandy silt stone, like this. Different formation at one phase. So behavior of mixed rock at one phase. We have monitored the target you see here, T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, okay? And this will show the movement of various targets at different changes, right? So what we can conclude from this figure, this table is that deformation of target varies with the rocks exposed near the target. So with the weaker rocks, we have larger deformation. The stronger rock, we have lesser deformation, right? Deformation obtained using Q of rock mass is more than the observed values for clay stone and less for the sandstone. So in such type of rock mass, where we have bended mixed rock, can we use the classification Q system? If yes, then what? should be the weighted values given to the queue. 
this is I, I have left for you to research. More deformation is recorded near weaker rocks like Kelestone and less near good rocks. Accordingly, primary supports were strengthened. And the last one, this is again very good example. You see here, the work remain is stopped for some days, but the it is rising. Okay, it is, but but the, the rate has it reduced. But when it started again, okay, but the final one trend is almost same. This is important. So deformation varies with the phase advance. Now, flexible support benefit I have shown here, in case of squeezing condition, we should go for the flexible support. Now, concluding the talk, the instrumentation, I think you will agree with me, the instrumentation is important to tackle the inhomogeneity of the rock mass, the expected rock mass behavior and tunnel deformation shall be estimated in advance. Accordingly, the allowable limits of control deformation shall be decided. As per the allowable deformation, the tunnel excavation size shall be decided. In case the tunnel deformation is more, or vice versa, then the estimated oblique, the expected deformation, primary supports shall be timely strengthened or reduced in subsequent rounds in similar conditions. Data shall be properly preserved to help in the development of the state-of-art technology, the work shall be carried out in the supervision of an expert. This is very important. This should certainly be carried out in the supervision of an expert. These are the references I have used for my talk. And these are the disclaimer, some disclaimer that this is only for some teaching sort of thing. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. Now I request Professor Manna, sir, to extend our gratitude for the enlightening talk by Dr. R.K. Goel by giving a memento as a token of appreciation. Thank you, sir. Hello everyone, I'm Arnold again. I made a one really, really big mistake in my presentation and I like to be complete. I forgot to mention <laughs> SJVN and uh, I, I'm so sorry that I forgot. They were the agency responsible for the vertical drilling and that was they did an awesome job. So please, if you could just thank them with me. Uh, and there was no checking my presentation. I really did write it in the car, so apologies for that. Thank you. So we have our last presentation of day one. Uh, it's an online presentation uh, by Mr. Neil Moss. So Mr. Neil Moss, uh, the technical director, tunnels at Gull, Jetlayer Consultant in Cranbrook, England. He's a chartered engineer and fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers, over 30 years of experience in construction design and engineering management, particularly in the tunneling and major projects. With a successful career marked by leadership in design management and construction within complex railway environment in the UK, Mr. Neil has significant senior management experience in both client and contractor roles. His focus on large diameter metro tunnels in urban area is evident in role ranging from TBM engineers to a temporary work engineers. As a tunnel lead members of the large authority, Mr. Nell directed underground construction for new schemes and rehabilitation of the project, showcasing his versatility and making him a valuable speaker with profound insight into tunnel engineering and construction management. So, uh, Mr. Neil Moss, welcome, and over to you, sir. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, crystal clear, sir. Please continue. 
Thank you. Right, I'm. Uh, it's good. Good evening. It's very. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and um, I'm. Uh, I'm very disappointed that I actually couldn't make it to India to to join you in person. Um, there were minor visa problems, um, and they, it never came through in time. Anyway, um, I will start my presentation now. Can you see that? Hang on a second. Uh, so, so I, uh, yeah, if required, you can uh, disconnect and then reconnect again. Okay. Let me just, I'm nearly there. Oh, sir, I think it's better if we, uh, if we share the PPT from this side and you can guide us then. Yeah, okay. Have you, have you received it now? Oh. You have mailed us, sir? I have mailed you, yes. Okay, sir. Just a second. Just a second. As I said earlier, I would much rather be there, but it wasn't possible. Um, next uh, My name is Neil Moss. I'm Technical Director for Tunnels for Gauls Idler. Uh, in uh, my immediate previous job, I worked as head of tunneling for London Underground uh, for 10 years uh, on many uh, large project transportation projects in London, including the uh, Northern Line extension um, and um, many of the station upgrades. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about um, segmental linings. Um, and spray concrete linings, and then a bit at the end about carbon reduction, which I think is something which is going to be very important for all of us in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, still fibre concrete uh, has been used in the UK since 1994, and I have been uh, lucky enough to have been involved right from the beginning. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, we developed steel fibre reinforced segmental linings because we had some very poor experience with unreinforced concrete linings. Um, in soft ground, particularly, it's very possible to have unre to technically possible to design unreinforced concrete linings, but for and all sorts of other things, we need a more robust lining, and that's what steel fibre uh, gives to us. Um, as I said, say there, tunnel linings are essentially compression member members, and the, the deflection is resisted by the ground. Next slide, thank you. Um, so the first project that I worked on that uh, used steel fibre contra uh, steel fibre segments was the um, Jubilee line extension contract 103. Uh, my involvement with 103 started right at the beginning of the design um, and um, the steel fiber segment a contractor's um, alternative which we supported as the designer and and developed a very a successful lining. Uh, the the segmental linings on Jubilee line extension were expanded concrete linings. There was no bolts, um, and they relied on um, being forced against the ground by the key when they were installed. A few years later, well, 10 years later, um, I worked on the Channel Tunnel Rail Link and was the responsible for the, the finalizing of the design of the segmental lining. Um, so there were four, four tunnel contracts on uh, HS1 phase two, and all of them used the same tunnel lining, which was fiber on, only steel fiber reinforced. But it also had a kilogram of polypropylene fiber in it to provide fire protection, which is an important consideration for a metro tunnel. Um, Initially, in 2000, and, in, sorry, in 1998, I tried to introduce steel fibre reinforced concrete segments 
to the Singapore Metro. But uh, we met with a lot of resistance, and the final nail was that the contractor determined that it was cheaper for him to put traditional rebar in than it was to import the steel fibres. So it took a further eight years before anybody finally managed to get steel fibre reinforced concrete segments in Singapore for the metro. Um, I, I worked briefly on the crossrail tunnel, and again, we used steel fibre reinforced concrete segments, um, and that was a, a prerequisite from the beginning of the design, um, which uh, it wasn't a contractor's alternative. It, they were designed to be steel fibre reinforced, and the main driver for that was durability. Um, we, by that stage, we, there were tunnels around the world that were exhibiting uh, problems with corrosion of reinforcement, and uh, steel fibres were not not to be were, were considered to be more durable. And again, we had one kilogram of uh, polypropylene fibre to provide the fire resistance. Move on 10 years and I became the engineer responsible for the Northern Line extension. And again, we used steel fiber reinforced concrete. This time the tunnel lining was only 5.2 meters design size because it's for, it's for a small, uh, for the London Underground, which has smaller tunnels than mainline rail. And then we move on to, to the last few years and um, Chilton's tunnel on HS2 is, uh, again, steel fiber reinforced, but it is the only one. The other uh, uh, the other three or four tunnels that are part of HS2 all have con conventional reinforcement. And in my view, this takes us back 30 years, but that's, that was the, the, the contractor's decisions. Uh, and then the largest tunnel in the UK, Silvertown Tunnel, um, which is uh, the, the tunneling has just been completed for both the running uh, both the road tunnel and the cross passages. Um, at, that's 10.6 meters in diameter. Um, as I say, it's the largest tunnel in the UK, and that's still fiber reinforced, except around the openings. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Next slide. So this is the Chilton's tunnel. As you can see, it, it looks looks really good. Um, there is water outside of here. Um, there are very few leaks. Um, it is 16 kilometers long, and it's therefore the longest steel fiber reinforced concrete tunnel in the UK. It has a design life of 120 years, and the tunneling should be complete early 2024. Um, and currently, Typically, they're getting 80 rings a week per tunnel, uh, which is 160 meters per week, which means 320 meters per week for both tunnels. Both tunneling machines are tunneling together. Next slide. This is a video. Could you press the button? So this is just a brief um, view of the Chilton's Tunnel. Um, this was the first mile that was completed. Um, all of these videos are publicly available. And then we reach the tunneling machine. Okay. Next slide. So, Silver, uh, then I'll uh, briefly talk about Silvertown Tunnel. This is only 1.4 kilometres long, which is relatively short. Um, it goes underneath the Thames um, to the southeast of, of on the southeast of London, 
and will provide a major um, additional capacity for cross for vehicle traffic crossing the river. But its primary purpose is to provide a route for buses. Um, at the moment, there are no no routes for double decker buses uh, in that part of London, and this will considerably add to that provision. Um, at a ten point nine six, a ten point yeah nine six diameter, it is the largest road tunnel in the UK, or well, the largest tunnel in the UK. Thank you. Next slide, and there should be a short video which just shows the TBM. It's only a minute or so showing the TBM being turned around to tunnel back in the opposite direction. Uh, the the T the two tunneling machines were Herring Connect machines, um, and they were variable density machines, um, and uh, of success they successfully completed their drives um, uh, a few months ago, and then we started. Well, we then carried on building the cross passages, and I'll talk about those a bit more in a minute. Okay, next slide. Right, a little bit about steel fibre. Um, one thing that I've become aware of over the last 30 years is that our concrete strengths in our segments have become increasingly stronger. So we typically specify a C50-60 to a 50 MPA concrete, but when, but due to the um, the amount of cement that's put into these, they're reaching strengths in excess of 80 MPA. This gives you a a, a, a very brittle concrete, and so the steel fiber manufacturers have, have had to catch up, and they've introduced much higher strength fibers because the tensile strength of the fiber has to increase in parallel with the strength of the anchorage and the anchorage gets bigger um, the more the, the higher the concrete strength next slide um, in my uh, my design is typically based on uh, model code 2010 um, the, the fib model code um, and we're still expecting this code to be incorporated in Eurocode, and it doesn't quite happen yet. Next slide. So, durability. Steel fibre reinforced concrete is a be is more durable than conventionally reinforced uh, uh, concrete. Um, they uh, they exhibit a strain hardening behavior. The distribution of the fibers throughout the concrete reduces the the cracking, and they have a, a, a they, they're resistant to corrosion. Um, in most of the applications that I've experienced, you only get a minor um, corrosion at the tip of the steel fiber where it breaks out of the concrete. But also the product of, corro of of rust, effectively, has ten times the volume of um, the material that's lost. But if you've only got a fiber that's maybe 0.8 millimeters thick, then the the product of the corrosion of the entire fiber is not going to give you a um, a, a major issue with corrosion. Thank you. Next slide. So I talk a bit about spray concrete lining. Same. So, so my first involvement with steel fiber reinforced uh, shotcrete was in uh, 1995 on the Jubilee line extension, um, where it was used to create the TBM launch chamber for um, contract C104, which was the running tunnels from London Bridge to Southwark. It was then used again at Heathrow. Um, Heathrow is more 
recognized for the problems they had but the steel fiber concrete was not didn't contribute to that problem it was mostly poor workmanship um, and then uh, we move on a few years and I was involved in the King's Cross station re redevelopment where all of the sprayed concrete linings were reinforced with um, steel fibers um, and a, a year or so later at Corsica Street shaft on channel tunnel rail link they also used steel fibers um, Crossrail was the big um, project in London that was almost entirely using steel fiber concrete um, both for the running tunnels and for the cross passage tunnels and the station tunnels there were some massive caverns uh, built at, um, that, that used steel fiber concrete um, then we get to the more recent past and we've been designing uh, cross passages using steel fiber reinforcement for both Chilton's tunnel and the Silvertown tunnel. Next slide, please. Um, so Chilton's tunnel, um, so this is the 16 kilometer tunnel in Chalk. It has 38 cross passages. Um, some of them are above the water table and some of them are below the water table. Um, but there's a toolbox of measures for injecting um, uh, grout to seal the leaks and provide a watertight tunnel. Um, and, and there's a, um, a daily review meeting which decides whether or where, which type of measure they need to implement. Um, the other thing to note about these cross passages is they have um, reinforced concrete opening support um, which is in because the tunnel is large enough to accommodate both the trains and the people um, and it shows the, um, uh, the the opening inside of the tunnel the opening so temporary well it's the permanent support for the opening inside the tunnel um, which is different to silver town tunnel next slide uh, this is a very quick video showing time lapse for um, the Chilton's Tunnel. Construction of cross passages. So then we put the waterproof lining in. In this case, it's sheet waterproof membrane because the cross passage is below the water table. Um, and that provides the durability and the long term water tightness. There's a lot of effort gone into detailing the waterproofing connection between the cross passages and the running tunnels. And that's the completed cross passage. Okay, next slide, please. Silvertown Tunnel. Silvertown Cross Passages are at the moment, well, they were initially unique in the UK, but they are now uh, where, because they are constructed using ground freezing to, um, stick, to provide uh, temporary support to allow the SCL excavation. Um, on the on the left on the right, you can see all the freeze pipes installed and the insulation uh, that's required to to keep the heat in. What we didn't do was um, insulate the actual pipes, and that's why you can see the frosting around the, each of the pipes. Um, on the left hand side, we've got a picture which shows the um, the frozen ground. And we've used thermal imaging camera to try and determine how the temperature range um, uh, in the tunnel and to determine what 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 the extent of the frozen body. So in this image, you can see that the air temperature varies between 
degrees and minus six, well, minus 15. Um, so the, the, the dark purple color is the frozen ground. Um, but the middle is in the, is kind of around about room temperature. Okay. Um, so, um, because I've just been talking about thermal imaging cameras, I would just like to make you aware that there, uh, but that Dr. Benoit Jones has developed a strength monitoring uh, system using thermal imaging for uh, for determining the early age of shockcrete or early age of spoke concrete linings. This has been uh, used uh, several times now in the UK uh, and. And is a, has been it needs to be calibrated for each project and, and each um, type of shock in each shockcrete mix, but it's uh, proving to be a very useful tool uh, in our armory for ensuring that we have a safe excavation. Next slide, please. So the green challenge. How do we reduce the embedded carbon in our concrete linings? Can we reduce the cement content? Can we remove cement entirely? Next slide. So traditional spray concrete is quite carbon rich. Uh, there are majority, there are very high amounts of Portland cement. We have steel fibers. We seem to have a conservative lining thickness generally. Um, there's rebound with sprayed concrete. Um, there's unused concrete in the pump lines. If if you pump the line, you know, if you pump the concrete to the face, uh, and we have multi-layer linings, and uh, and of course diesel plant. Next slide. So one solution would be to replace steel fibers with polymer, um, and we can see that. If you, uh, but also if you replace do cement replacement, if you replace twenty five percent of the of the cement with GGBS, uh, um, then you improve the carbon content by about fifty percent. Um, if you increase the amount of GGBS. Um, and use polymer fibers, then you can to 75%, then you can reduce the, um, the carbon content even more, um, round to, down around about 25% um, of the uh, total carbon content. So these are areas that we need to explore. Next slide. So can we eliminate cement entirely. Uh, down in Australia, um, they've developed a, a polymer, a geopolymer concrete, for, for, uh, specifically for segmental linings at the moment. Um, it was developed by Wagner's Australia and it has no Portland cement. It has a polymer that, re that provides the reaction to bind the aggregates and uh, fly ash uh, together. Uh, it has been tested, full scale testing has been carried out in Germany, um, and but uh, as far as I'm aware, there is nobody that's actually used it for segments yet. But it's a distinct possibility that we're going to very shortly going to be able to make uh, segmental linings without cement. Next slide, please. So, um, just a summary of the properties of the geopolymer concrete. Um, it can easily reach the C50, C60 that we need. Um, its flexural strength is com comparable with Portland cement based steel fiber reinforced concrete. Um, it has excellent spalling resistance. So, these are the kind of base things for segmental lining design. Um, uh, it, there, it has been approved for use in the German equivalent of Eurocode 20, 2006 
as a as a binder um it, and it has a, as i said before it has a very low embodied carbon footprint so it reduces both essentially 80 percent 81 percent of uh, the carbon content of traditional concrete thank you and i need to thank charles allen of opb concrete for for the information thank you next slide so concluding for segmental linings it's already possible to remove cement replacing rebar with steel fibers reduces the embedded carbon and provides a more durable lining for scl linings uh, select cement replacements such as fly ash and pbs can be reduce the embedded carbon and replacing steel fibers with polyfibers is possible but there needs to be more research next slide please thank you very much for listening i hope this has been interesting um, i wish to express my gratitude to the organizing committee um, and i'm sorry for all of the it problems thank you thank you very much mr moss for a very informative lecture so thank you sir now you. i would like to invite professor dipansu on stage to extend our gratitude towards Professor Bhimanna for his wonderful efforts in the coordination and management of this session by pro presenting a token of appreciation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Neil Moss, for the lovely lecture. Thank you, sir. Good evening. So uh, we are going for the dinner to India Habitat Center. Once you just step out, if you go to the right, you will exit the seminar hall. But if you go straight in the tunnel, you will. Uh, there are buses waiting for delegates to be taken to India Habitat Center. And uh, all the invited speakers who have their personal transport they will take you to India Habitat Center, and then they will drop you back at your hotel. OK, sir? All the invited speakers who were given personal transport. All the delegates, we will take the bus. We will go to India Habitat Center. And after dinner, we are done. So <laughs> I hope you will have Uber or whatever from wherever you came. And uh, we will see you tomorrow morning at 10 AM. Absolutely, you are a it's independent country. You can fly also. No worries. Sir, silver Oak at the IIT. Huh? Silver Oak. Sir, silver Oak. And for those people who are driving themselves, it is Silver Oak. The venue is Silver Oak. Yeah, there are several rooms, but we booked Silver Oak. And volunteers kindly guide them to the buses. Thank you.